Week four of the NECC Rocket League here with you is Hail Monkey Man. Alongside myself, I am Bear Lights, and we're looking to kick things off strong. It's a Friday, Hail Monkey Man. I'm feeling good about yourself. Oh, I'm feeling like I haven't slept in two days. That may be true. That also may just be because I'm so excited to see the middle portion of NECC League Play, Rocket League, all these other games that NECC has been able to present have been pretty darn cool, but this one is the best way to end your week. High octane fashion, literally octanes on a giant uh, kind of rectangular prism field. So I'm excited about it. And I know that our teams, uh, they're looking for some progression here. It's, it's the middle of the, uh, the season, the middle of the pack, and these teams are trying Trying to be able to, to separate themselves from each other. High octane, some prefer high finick, but either way, uh, we definitely have that action coming at you. In fact, we head over to the Emergence New England division here with our first matchup. It'll be Jay Wu Yellow facing off with NEC The Grimms. Hail Monkey Man, uh, of course, a good way to start things off is by going to the Emergence division, a division that's always a shakeup and uh, two teams looking to get their first win here today. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those interesting uh, forays into, into progressions when, in your Rocket League ranks. You have the Navigators, which is, you know, everyone that's either starting into the game, being competitive for the first time. But Emergence is when everyone starts getting super serial. Can you be able to maintain that? And can you keep it up? But it's going to be the Wildcats and, of course, the Grims, which I learned it was Patty the Pilgrim for NEC. So I don't know if that's like a... Oh, a downward spiral into the darkness of being the Grims, or maybe that's just like their cool nickname, but otherwise, well, these teams uh, are kind of in the gutter. They've not been able to pick up a win as of yet. They want to be able to change that here in this week of play, but of course, they got to be able to start that off with just some consistency. If you've not bounced off of week number one, two, and three very well, hey, so this is the beginning of that either uphill uh, run or downhill slide. We hope for the, the former. Of course. Well, let's go ahead and check out the rosters. See who's on these squads. We'll start over with Jaywoo Yellow here and uh, check out who's here. It is Realm, Ace, and Ansi taking the pitch here for uh, this Jaywoo Yellow side. And of course, a bit of experience here. Ansi stepped in as a junior last time I got to see these two teams, or this team face off rather, in week one and uh, definitely had quite the performance as a leader there on the older side of things. A graphic designer too, so no, uh, uh, no surprise there that he finds creative ways to get the ball in the back of the net. What is that cyber threat intelligence and defense sophomore ace that's going to try and infiltrate from the back line and see if they can be able to get this team some level of assistance, be able to just be able to get some of those demos and hey, just find some space. But we go over as well to NEC the Grims as we have this three set now to theirs and I think that this team is going to be interesting because they have they have a little bit younger of a squad they have some freshmen and maybe one bit of uh, senior uh, itis hopefully not itis because last night I had senior itis it actually kept me from doing very well in school but uh, when it comes to, to this squad with Jay Wu I think that just like you said Ansi was a pop off uh, performing player and that could be the difference maker we, we spoke so much about them you've seen them in other programs and i, I think that that uh, really was just a step away from finding them that first big win that's right because it was they were so close to getting it done too i believe it went to a game five and um you know together they were able to really rally the troops they didn't start off very strong but uh, they were able to uh, try, try to get it together and and they definitely had a successful uh run towards the end maybe they get some momentum rolling into this week we'll have to see but like you were mentioning with nec grams i mean uh these three players uh together and and obviously freshman freshman sophomore coming in so uh, a little bit of experience could be a bit of an issue but uh when you have the type of talent that this team does they're able to uh to win every single week we'll see if they can uh uh you know obviously it hasn't started that way but we'll see if they can kind of transition that as josh um uh Drip and Knox will take the field for this team here tonight yeah and this is uh the start of something hopefully more than yourself as you have uh, a program that's uh, kind of made with youth right now you have one senior and john wick but otherwise the rest right now you have the freshman freshman sophomore with josh uh, Gripsy and Noxern, and of course, uh, we often get to be able to see the programs and of, well, as well as the majors that these uh, teams are trying to be able to uh, go into for their studies. A lot of criminal justice, business, admin, as, as well as computer information systems. There's a lot of interconnections that are in information systems, so maybe Josh is going to be able to lead their team with just that extra year of experience. You know that for freshmen, you know, it kind of spells itself. Freshman is fresh man, but sophomore is wise fool. That is exactly what that means. They know just a tiny bit more. This is some education for all the boomers in the chat as well, as sophomores are able to basically uh, blind leading the blind, because they're like, yeah, I 
know what I'm doing. Hopefully, they definitely know what they're doing. But we're going to do game number one. It's going to be best of five time tonight. It's like every other night when it comes to weekly league play here for the NECC. And NECC and NEC or NECC, NEC. Not, don't get those confused. We're just calling them the Grims. <laughs> All right. We're the Grims. All right. Well, we kick off game number one. And a quick correction. Actually, JWU at three and zero. And uh, a win from NEC on the books too in week one. So we got that updated for you all. We appreciate your patience as we uh, <laughs> receive the information in real time. But we begin here as off the bat, these two teams looking for a strong start here as they both have had strong starts in the season, it turns out, Hill Monkey Man. <laughs> it was all of a decoy, all of a ploy to make us look like fools. I swore the last <laughs> time we saw these guys, Ansi was doing well, but it's Mega Mind with big brain plays as we get Jaywoo. Wait, no, wait, who's in yellow? Which one's in yellow? <laughs> Is it Jaywoo? <laughs> Ansi was in EC off the bat here. Ah! Kicking things off in organized fashion. And so NEC definitely wanted the strong start, got the first goal off the kickoff. It'll be Jay Wu trying to push back and get a quick answer on the f a quick fake there by Ace. Almost allowed them to have it. And Realm still on it here for Jay Wu. But Mega Mine will try to tap it back down and cause a little bit of chaos. But it's Josh back on it here as NEC. They're able to, to get out of harm's way. It looks like Jay Wu is trying to push back, but uh, it's very important that you try to hold off that answer goal and try to establish a little bit more momentum to, uh, to kick things off. And if any of you are confused, Dripsy is Mega Mind, but maybe this is just a big brain play as they want to be able to rebrand throughout the middle of the season. Why not? Big catch right now by Josh. He's in a one on one against Realm, and they won't get any extra boost, but they get. Uh, they got boosted based on their own strength. Be able to win two big 50s. Jumping in from the corner, they set up an extra option. And they're going to swing for the top. That actually is a lot of whifty whifties. Everyone looking for a loose ball play. But the first minute and 20 keeps the Grims on top for now. They've been able to maintain a lot of forward lane space. And look at that timing. Knox is able to just main paint this one all the way up to the back line. They just can't quite get the shots to the bottom. Yeah, quickly making patience their identity right now because they seem to not rush into those challenges. They are trying to uh, really find the correct play and kind of rotate accordingly. And I think they've been doing a good job at that. But they will need to dig themselves out of a tough uh, situation here as that one's heading back towards their net. But NEC right back on it offensively after that kind of trade off of possessions here at midfield. As Jaywu and Nancy trying to play out, but Megamind right on yet again. And Realm will be forced to try and play out, but shielded into the zone again goes New England College. Finally, it'll be Jaywu uh, to at least get a little bit of space. This is a tug of war, and someone's bringing sumo wrestlers, and it's usually NEC Grimms as they just wait and stop at will any of the forward progression by Jaywoo. These Wildcats are still trying to be able to roar forward. Ace with a takeaway out in the middle of the pitch, and that's Ansi who's jumping on it. What a save to get underneath. This is another setup. Does Ansi turn around? Yes, they do, but they see a counterattack performing, so they've got to get right in front. They'll actually take away the boost, hold him by the hand, and deny at least a free lane straight in the middle, but this is the midway mark and more now of game number one, and it's Grimm's with still just that opening score. Jaywoo has got to watch out from their back line. They're committing a lot uh, too far forward, I would say, on a couple of the last possessions here. So, I mean, if you're NEC, obviously you want to push forward and expose that open space that's on the back line, perhaps get a sleeper goal, if you will, and they'll try to expose that. But Ansi has other ideas, trying to start up and jumpstart Jaywoo here. And settle the ace of play right back in this zone. He'll eyeball the corner and try to get the touch prior. Although good speed, it will just fall right into the box where NEC is able to get the big clear out and kill more time with a minute 45 remaining on the clock. The only sleeper goal that's going to happen today is if someone gives me a controller and I'm passing out of my desk. Looking for a hook shot. Realm is actually trying to be able to hand it off over to Ace who abandons ship. And it looks like they were trying to just have an individual carry, but they do have an extra option. And that's Ansi with a waterfall down. Can they get on top of this ball? No. Oh, it falls short. Hits the post on the outside. We go lateral edge. And again, Ace is going to track it down. But that was one of the best looks we've seen so far for Jay Wu. And we're sub 80 seconds remaining. Grims are under fire, under duress, but they haven't given up based on the press. Yancey, back across they go. A good touch out here. And in fact, Realm oh wasn't ready for it. And a mistake there on the back line will open things up for NEC. And so 2-0. And just wasn't expecting that power from Platt, it would seem. And so they're in man back just a little bit off the mark. And Jaywoo looking to kind of bounce off of this one because this has, just hasn't been their game one. 
No, it really hasn't. There's been a lot of opportunity. They have been fist fighting in the box. There has been so many chances. They've either stopped the ball in the top of it, or they've had uh, shots that we just saw a moment ago that turned into a two-goal swing. What could have been a 1-1 one -one becomes a 2-0. So, yes, being able to key it up. Sometimes you don't start off great in game number one, and Grimms are trying to solidify that with e uh, extra insurance. Maybe a big counterplay here, and have to chase after that. It is on target. That's going to sneak through. So with waning seconds, the waning minute, we just still have a ball game. Yeah, it's just found a way to, to play it back in. And of course, when you see the last defender, their momentum automatically has to go back towards their own net. So if you play it deep, right, play it high, it's a very difficult one to dig out, right? It's imagine in, in baseball, if you watch traditional sports, over the shoulder type of catch or football as well, right? It, it's so difficult to judge that sometimes. And so you never know. Good things happen if you just put it on net. But give your uh, team a chance to play. Give your team a chance to win. Those may develop into something of a miracle or more. Magic happens here on 34th Street, and that's exactly all the streets that are here in Rocket League. A big pickup by Josh, trying to be able to level it over. There's no boost in Josh's tank, and so that one does fall to the backboard. And now it's a melee. Ansi will be able to get a demo with 10 seconds coming up. Game number one has become a banger here in late term. That one goes very far lateral, finding the boost. Ansi may be able to find possession to the corner. Falls over. Oh, and the shot will be denied. What a clearance. They're going to have to go the full length of the pitch, and that one will end up to the back wall, will end up to the floor. Whew. It was really <laughs> knocking on NEC's oh. door, but ends up ultimately going to the Grimms. Yeah, the Grimms will get away with this one in a, a strong start, right? You, we talked about early when you get the first goal, you don't want to surrender to the next one because then you just gave up the the uh, the amount of momentum that you kicked off with, right? And so uh, because they were able to get that second goal, not only did that give them a little bit of momentum, momentum towards the second half of the game, uh, but also in addition to it, when you give up and surrender a goal that maybe you shouldn't have, you go back and you uh, you look at it and you're like, hey, maybe that shouldn't have been one uh, against us. NEC did a good job to, uh, to establish that lead early, uh, make sure that they are in the right place, right, it points wise. So that way, you know, when you do have one go through, you're able to hold off at the very end. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to know, do, does it look like I'm getting set up for like being in a mocap or something? Maybe like, you know, wine party? This is a very uh, nice. spotted yeah, shirt. Nice yeah, shirt. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah. I wore this while I took a nap and that lasted for all of a minute, but I had a great dream <laughs> and it was of this series as we start off and kick off NECC's mid pack, mid of the entire season for the spring semester. And of course, there's a lot of teams that are looking towards maybe a nationals push, maybe be able to find themselves in a big playoff. And yeah. 3-0. I mean, we were we were completely debated on what the records were before. This is a team right now in the likes of Jaywoo, especially with ANSI. With yep. one game dropped, they know how to be able to play from behind, but also be able to establish themselves. Game one, wash it away. That's something that you're just going to knock off, be able to just drop off, and be ready to pop off as they go into game two. Yeah, because they had a majority of the chances moving into the latter half, so we'll see if they can build off of that. Mega Mines in the Scarab. That's not a card you see very often these days. It used to be a meme and even got used less where, to the point where you're basically not even involving it at all. So interesting choice. But uh, we'll see. Mega Mind was effective in the last game. Perhaps a meme or perhaps trying to, to get some use out of the card for once. Hey, I like that card. That's a great card. Because you become ball. And they're trying to ball right now. Ace. I knew they'd sneak through the back line. Able to just find it around that corner. It was Ace that set up the first. And then just playing off of the tire 50. Not having to rely on a teammate. Getting right back over to it. Ansi was there in support. But all they had to do was clap hands. And that's Jaywoo in the opening half minute that finds uh, the first goal. Yeah, good read. Good anticipation. Staying on the play. Typically, you don't want to jump out and be that aggressive. Especially after coming off a loss. But for Jaywoo, I mean, taking chances will sometimes pay off. And it worked for NEC in game number one. And so why not uh, try? yourselves and so Jay Wu doing their best New England College impression there we'll see if they can continue this momentum but that one's gonna be given away on the goal line and he can't dig it out it'll be Knox with the goal here to even it at one Knox is an opportunist. I don't care. They put Platt in the front of their name. That might as well be Valorant level uh, performing because they're doing very, very well to stay in the middle of the pack as well as just keep at and around the upper hemisphere of that defensive box and force Jay Wu to kind of stutter start and push to their heels. And already a big challenge into this corner as Realm's going to try and find it. And that's a big demo, but that's Mega Mine that's trying to get in the way. That's a free Whoa. shot. There's so many fireworks. Knox finds a second. Are we sure this isn't Noxus from Northwood? <laughs> I mean, he's been great, right? Putting it back 
Uh, it, it just causing the defense to scramble constantly. I mean, they try to make save after save, and even though you do go down 1-0, New England College has really been bouncing back, and Knox has been a large part of that. Ready, looking for a third? Okay, well, all right. Huh. This is becoming volatile, Bear. I'm actually a little bit concerned because Jay Wu's looked like they had set up to finally get their offense kind of set and steady, and then NEC just went right back to where they kind of left off before. Yeah, they were kind of defensively stunted and waiting and staying, but both these teams are getting a little bit hectic. The shot's forthcoming, but look at that floating read to be able to get that stop. Yeah, and now not able to shield it is Jay Wu as this will fall to the hands of New England College. A quick flick, but not going to... Really get around much there as Ace was able to jump in and make the play. Well, he's going to be bested by Knox the other way. He'll slingshot that one back towards the back wall. This shot a little bit high. Had an opportunity to make it 3-1. Now Jay will try to answer with a quick transitional play, but everybody back for New England College in good rotation. And although a pinch uh, got to challenge them, push it back towards the box, they will ultimately get a couple of saves here, but not done is Jay Wu. Go in to the midpoint just with less than three minutes to go. Jaywoo. We've been able to get one. You see Grimm's have been able to build. And that's something that we really haven't seen yet from the Wildcats. You got a rule one. This is the 2v2. Who's best in the 2v2 world? You actually have Mega Mine with a back pass over to Nox. Nox so far has been an absolute demon. It could be Noxus, they could be Noxious, they can just continue to be obnoxious against the defense, who has to answer in kind to them. Ace, though, has been able to slip in, now this becomes a 1v2, lost it over to the back end, but no wide-angle shooting. And if you go into these rule ones, you better be ready for your individual play to be just that darn good. They actually clear it, and that oh nearly turns my. into karma immediately. Yeah, you could have for sure, and, but... I mean, it's a tough decision, right? Because you have Ansi locked uh, uh, in there. But yeah, it sure will. Shot down, bar down and in. So, I mean, you want to free up Ansi, right? But to break a rule one, that's tough to do. Because then things like this happen. As NEC now up 3-1. No, I... I mean, maybe they just weren't confident in the twos. I can, I can see doing it. You look, look, it's... It's it, Ansi's really, really good. You get the guy back, you get him in the rotation, but then at what cost? Well, you know, you turn into two. So two minutes with a two up. Grims are looking like they're just keeping this going. Ansi is back in the field of play. You gotta turn this into high value. If you're gonna invest into getting a player back by committing just karmatic injustice and crimes, well, then you gotta get this guy on target. And what a shot by Ansi, he's brought him back. And this is why you wanted to break it, right? Because he's been so effective in, in times where you feel like you're out of a game. And he can be a difference maker in that way. Completely revitalize the mindset coming in for a team. And for Jaywoo, they find themselves back within one now with a minute 51. Much more doable in the eyes of this team. Who, you know, have seen this NEC team for the first game, right? Trying oh, to feel it out oh. there. From the ceiling, a chance for Megamind. But couldn't quite finish there as it was answered. A good creative play to try to get around the defender from NEC, but this will fall right back into the hands of Ansi. He'll play it in for Jaywoo, looking for another opportunity. Tries to get a bump there, but it could clear out from Knox. We'll hurry up some of that pressure. So far, Jaywoo have had great kind of more open field orientation outside the box, whereas NEC has done very well by having someone go and be volatile and just pushing a bullet onto that back line. That's something that's been of difference. Like you kind of really squeeze that back third if you're the Grims, and Jay Wu are trying to be able to score and be able to connect from out in open space. That one's a little bit more standard. What a, what a stay, what a fake, what a flick. It's a 3v1, oh, wow. it's 3v done! Knox does it himself! What a good way to get the hat trick. Such a, 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 a strong representation of what this team can do and what this player can do. We talked early in this series about how they've been playing very patiently. And so to get that fake and put it right on the top of his car, you knew something special was going to happen from his performances in the first couple of games. And sure enough, it continues as that flick was something else to complete that hat trick there for Knox. But now. It's Jaywoo who needs to answer here. You can't let one player run over you like this. You gotta have a full team effort to answer the bell. Ox has just been a demon. Like to see it. If you're opposite of him, you hate to see it. But you know what? When you're in business administration, this is the type of player that is ready to take on the world, own their own business. You're getting slapped around, Jay Wu. This is going to be an interesting situation because if this is maintained, they will have their perfect record threatened by NEC, who is trying to be able to improve from uh, week to week. They are one on one, looking for even more. Jay Wu. Slinging it down. They have to score with time remaining if they don't want to be at match point. The reverse sweep, though, seems inevitable here, Bear. Yeah, <laughs> does it? 
We can see it. Ace. We'll try to push to Ancy. This one will run out of time. It'll be NEC. Yes, they will be at match point here. And it, swing around one for good measure as Ancy will try to at least put some momentum into game number three here. Because they'll need it because they do have that uphill battle to face. Like you mentioned, it'll be a reverse sweep attempt for Jaywoo, who I believe did that before, if I'm not mistaken. And it was led by Ancy. So you can't get comfortable. But if you're NEC right now, you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, I would, I would say I'm like, you know what, 2-0, okay, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing a few extra things, but let's talk about Nox. I mean, honestly, he calls himself yeah. Plat Nox. That, that dude is uh, several levels above Plat. Maybe some of levels below. Maybe we have no idea, but <laughs> Nox has been doing work out there. I thought that we were going to be seeing a lot more when it came to Megamind. Megamind, maybe a little bit of fun extra, especially because they went over to the Scarab, and of course they have like the best uh, uh, motor sound in the world, which I think is, uh, <laughs> which one is that, the Go-Kart or the like, Go Kart? Yeah, yep, it's, yeah, it is perfect. Just oh, Jeff's kiss. But Nox has been able to be an absolute nuisance, a challenger, and a defensive man all over the pitch to really lead that squad. Yeah, he has been uh, dynamic in all senses of the word, right? Because the patience isn't just about goal scoring, right? It's about uh, setting up the play, uh, kind of, you know, getting the full vision before you move forward. And I think if you rush things, especially here at the emergence divisions, it can get a little bit dicey, right? You want to have a game plan coming in, and the more patience you have in, in space that you create for an Ox, the better. Because his ball control is outstanding. He's able to find a teammate if he needs to, to, to find a pass. Or sometimes he can just hold on to itself, like his third goal in this game, uh, to get a flick over the last defender. I mean, any way you chop it up, he's been great. I do wonder though, so you're in a position where, all right, you cannot drop any more games. This is must win if you want to stay perfect on the season. You have someone like Nox that's basically running around supreme. And if you're going to either have the accessories around them that do give you that those options to so just let them be off the leash, what do you do? Do you isolate? Do you dominate? Do you just try to challenge them early? It seems like you can't put all your eggs in one basket, but you got to find a basket to carry because right now every single one that Jaywoo has had has been left on by the wayside. We're going to game number three. There's a lot, of, a lot of questions to answer, and I've got no solutions. Yeah, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about it and debate, and one of the first go-tos is you got to target him, right? Target him. Dim it. Dimo. Go out of your way to make sure that he's not a nuisance. You can't go out of your way with this team, right? With, with NEC on the other side. To go out of your way and get a bumper demo, that's out of the question. But find the right time. There's the right opportunities. You know, obviously, with the defensive rotation that has been effective with NEC, he's got to be in net at some point in time. You just got to locate win and then make the bump happen then. Ancy going to kick it off here for Jaywoo, though, as he's got the first goal of game number three. If you can't quite get onto one player, force all of the players to be stuck in their own back half. And that was consistent rotation. You saw it just being smothering into that back right corner. And eventually they worked it to the lateral edge. What a great pickup to just loft, float that in. And Ansi is looking for those moments from open space, from that midfield line forward on when they can dive in. Oh, the one-two connection. Well, it's just a bit short, but Grimms are already looking for a response. Yeah, and sure enough, it was no other than Nux to set that one up early and try to cause a little bit of chaos. Well, he's going to leave this one here. They shot well high, though, as that was an opportunity for a shot on net. Had the angle, had the presence of mind to, to try and attempt a shot. It was just off the mark. And so that'll allow any uh, Jaywoo to push out of the zone. But for how long, right? It's New England College has been all over them constantly in this series, and it looks like it's going directly back to that as Megamind was up for that one. Back in the Octane, a car with a little bit more shape. Well, that's good. But Nancy will get yeah. that bump there back line, but a good job to come around in support for NEC. Are you saying round isn't a shape? No? <laughs> I mean, you're a better, a more effective shape. All right. <laughs> okay. I understand. All right. All, all my Good. circle all right. gang out there was squinting. They were mad for a second. They're just like, oh, you're a square guy? Hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> three minutes uh, approaching, remaining here in game number three. And Jay Wu, uh, the last time around, they had their goal and they uh, didn't really get to enjoy it because NEC, the New England College Grims, were able to find. Uh, an, an answer, and then they uh, were able to double up upon it. So it's great for the Wildcats right now, being in a position where they haven't really panicked and they've kept everything kind of moving against them. This has been a, a slightly sloppier, slightly more lackadaisical affair in these rotation for the Grims. They really have been able to uh, elongate this field for very long. They have singular chances. We're looking for the secondary, the tertiary, the control, and look, look how far back they now have to play. Yeah, it's not as polished, I would say. It, it, you're right. 
It just hasn't had the same click factor. I don't think they've lost it completely, but they've gotten more complacent than anything else, and it's not something you can do at this level. But that being said, I mean, you have New England College on the other side that hasn't been able to take advantage of opportunities that, uh, you know, Jaywoo has, has given them for the most part. And so, yeah, a bit of sloppy play, sure, but no chance. Uh, oh. There's never a bad time for Knox to do things like that. But a good flick up and over. A bit of a loft there to tie the game here. And do you figure they were always in arm's reach? This is this is so hard to predict. You can't really predict this because so many teams, they look for the set piece plays, right? You go yep. around, you set to the corner, you be able to make a one-two infield pass, boom. No, Knox says, all right, that's been fun. My ball now, my time. And just <laughs> lifts it over the defender. So sub two minutes ago, we're all knotted up at one apiece. Most of the time, it's been the Grims that's been able to find that difference maker to the ceiling. It becomes a bit of a neutral 50, but out to the 45 becomes an advantage. Over to the Wildcats, and Ansi is trying to be able to back pass it over to him. And Knox, honestly, just looks like they're playing with moon shoes. I know that most of you weren't alive when those came out, but they are just bouncing around. Oh, man. Love some moon shoes. Oh, yeah. Always gave me some height, which is something I've always needed in Rocket League. Wondering if I could apply it there. Look, it's New England College though pushing this box here. And a late challenge finally comes out from Ace, but it was awkwardly from a little bit of boost from inside the net. So a lot of boost usage that could have been solved by just having one member on the back wall. I mean, the back wall is something that should be guarded at all times, especially at this rank. And so we'll see if they can make the adjustment accordingly, because using that boost will not help you uh, on the defensive zone. But that touch will, as it'll try to get it out of harm's way. But NEC already has a game point to put it right back oh. on the pitch. But a good job from ANSI to touch this one back out. But New England College piecing together some passing. They're looking a little bit stronger than they were in the first few minutes. Oh, what was that touch? That was so good. And that extended the field. ANSI is just barely able to get out of the way. Some of these undercut passes and redirects are really starting to be threatening by the Grims. Daewoo got to be sweating right now. They don't want their first loss on the season to be a sweep, but NEC is at least putting that in their thoughts. The doubts are starting to come about. Realm with a 50-50, that goes wide. Knox puts it out in open space, and they get beat. Ansi just makes sure to be there. They get the whole put back, and that's a lead back to Jaywoo. Yeah, Realm did a good job with the 50-50, and so, you know, as a defender there in that position, you're kind of handcuffed because it's coming directly at you. What do you do? I mean, a, a pop might have worked there, but at the same time, you just try to catch. Goes off uh, the defender's car right out to, into open space, and Nancy was ready to put that directly back in. Not a high-velocity shot, but a uh, highly aware shot there from Nancy, and that's what he's known to do. And one of the reasons why Jiwoo was able to dig out from behind in a, a previous series, and with the seven seconds left, it looks like they might get their first win of this one. But Knox... Might have other ideas here. We'll let it bounce. Has a chance, but it will be knocked to the ground. Jaywoo able to get one here on the board. It'll be 2-1 in the series now. So you know, we were talking way, way earlier here in game number three. All right, what, what, what are the solutions? What do you do? And you were saying, do not isolate or overextend to just shut down Knox. Because it happens in those key moments when you absolutely need it to at the very end that's when they were able to accomplish it that's when they were able to shut them down because they had those individual plays Knox obviously getting the only goal for uh or NEC in this game number three which was able to tie it all up when you find him trying to then extend that pitch by himself and maybe create that space and open up thoroughfare for the rest of his team they said nah that's when we're getting the, the takeaway and that's when it all worked out for him that's right, and it's very easy in a game where you might surrender your first loss of the season, right, in a match, and it was going to be by sweep. It's uh, very easy to get in your own heads. Like you said, that was at least a thought that was going through their minds. If you're Jaywoo, uh, that, that might happen to you. And so to put that out of their minds and then make that adjustment in the second half of a decisive game definitely shows how this team likes to play. We talked about the identity of NEC. It's Jaywoo's turn, right? It's all about never being out of a series, never being out of a game, and they've turned it around here and at least got one on the board, but they got two more to go. One on the board. Hey, how do you take your second step? You gotta take your first. That's what's been That's right. done. The That's right. third is right around the corner as long as you don't stumble. Make sure you tie your shoes. Look the right way, look both ways, and then head across the street. Game number five is in a far future because game number four is right around that corner. I think that NEC, I mean, they're, they're key here. We haven't seen it, is to be able to get that first score. 
That's something that has, in fact, eluded them. We looked to, for the putback shot already as early pressure is at the Grimm's defensive half. And Nox, you see how many times he's playing more for the defensive fakeouts? He's still trying to test that Jaywoo backline and what they're going to do for him. And if it's worked before, do you keep at it, right? Until, you know, Jaywoo can prove that they've, uh, they've been able to adjust and are, are going to play patiently like you do. And right now, I don't think Jaywoo's done enough to really prove that that's the case. A 2-1 win isn't very convincing to me that that's the case. So you keep throwing it, right? Because if the other team's going to keep biting on it, well, I mean, you still have another game in hand, technically. Not that you want to give it away. But that's a good oh. passing play, though, from Jaywoo to kick these off. And they're up 1-0. Ace infiltrating the back line. A nice dive between them. And Ancy says, hey, man, finish that up. Oh, why, thank you. <laughs> and just a nice little doink re redirect to be able to push it through. That was, that's, Ancy has been able to find not only the net, but his teammates so readily across this pitch. And it's something the Grimms need an answer for because he's pretty much everywhere and with haste. Yeah, it certainly was. And uh, not the car that you want to see in your rear view mirror or right in front of you because those challenges are coming and they're very wise choices, right? From the junior, it has that experience and continues to use it on a regular basis. As now he just put it back down the field and he might have a bump out in front to work with, but uh, no <laughs> such space was given up and so Nox will be allowed the chance to carry back into the zone, play 50 low, but Realm was the first to get to it for Jaywoo. And now let's Bit of a stumble there on the back side, and Jaywoo had a couple opportunities to jump on it, but just no uh, support there to tap it in the back of the net. I think we're seeing a difference of micro versus macro. Lots of, of kind of full field push, but also not rushing zones by the likes of the Wildcats, whereas NEC, they're looking for individual plays. That big demo blinded the cameraman, wow. and us to Knox finishing it off. He got an air dribble carry to bring that all the way to the crossbar, and then the slam dunk just put it through. Yeah, able to tap it in. Double touch was uh, was available, and I mean, that was a quick reaction double touch too. I mean, yeah. we, we've seen in the emergence division plenty of double touches. Don't get us wrong, but to have that kind of reaction time, it's unreal. And so, you know, having this true leader with some talent here has got to feel good. I mean, New England College stands up for 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 Knox for sure. So the rest of the team uh, looking to really rally, feed off that energy, come back. And close out this series because you'll let Jaywoo have one more, and then a game five's not where you want to be. Uh, this one's going to be challenged by Ansi. Back to it is going to be Josh. She's holding, waiting. Ace beats him to it, but he got just enough to play it over to a teammate on the right wall, and Mega Mind will play out in the air, but will be hit down by Ansi. Ace continues to it, but it'll be left for Knox, the man who's even this game here. But 2.36 left. And a big boomer back down the field. Ace Holtz will try to play to center field. Nong's right back on it. He's up for it too. But a good job from Ansi to read that play and get up and make that challenge. There's been a lot of free roaming dribbling. Realm in a very tough situation. Literally staring at the wall and all of an inch or so before that one became a dire straight. But we've seen Megamind trying to emulate what Nox has been doing. Lots of just open space. Let me take this dribble. Josh with a fantastic flick pass. But Nox is not able to get to it in time. Megamind Ooh. trying to immediately come in with authority from the opposite half and get back to it. And look at the, look at the, how and, and they're not kind of macro passing in terms of like wide angle arcs, but they're rotating just flat from the ground and trying to win that game of just from that level. Not have to go too high to be able to get these shots on target, but this is also a dangerous mode, and now wow. that gives Ace a chance. It's a free ball. Put it through. Nothing fancy at all. Mega Mind thought he had support and did, but Realm read that all the way from way back in his own end and then still used his boost to, to head up forward, get the play uh, you know, set into a position where Jaywoo had the end advantageous place. Put it in the back of the net, so just smart thinking, right? On their feet thinking, uh, quick challenges, catch them off guard. And Jay was doing a good job at that here. And we'll have to continue to do that, because you know at some point during this game, New England College is going to try to get it back, and this might be the time to do so. It'll be Knox. They'll go up for it. Back up of two minutes, a double commit, and third man's already up. Josh will try to keep the zone instead. they got to watch out for a transition, and a smart play to play it back towards the defensive side, although it almost harmed them. It'll still be out from NEC, who's still struggling here. Another opportunity from J. Wu is right there from the box. And finally, New England College trying to get out, but still trapped in the zone by Jaywoo. This one available, but a good job from the defense again. One minute remains. 
Dagger after dagger is being thrown and dodged, even though then you have the Grims very wounded, but not mortally Whoa. so. What a dunk, what a save, and now trying to get out of harm's way. That's an overcommit. Mega Mine to the sidewall. 40 seconds. Jaywoo trying to survive on a razor thin margin of difference. Whoa. The undercut to be able to pass it around. We have some key attacks by the Grims. Mega Mine is going too far. Too much ball, too much thought, not enough monk. They're just trying to be able to push it <laughs> forward, and now they have Jaywoo's just t attacking at him. Yeah, but now it's Nox, not the person oh! you want to play, but Realm able to make a save. Now back on it, this will be bar down, or ceiling down rather, but still out this center field. As you saw Nox gathering it up, had the musty in his back pocket, but still not done. A chance to double, oh, it's off the mark as well. Ace still holds on, back to Nox, he's got a chance to shot. It goes in! Still now finds the corner, and it's even at two with zero seconds left. Ain't no way! Ain't no way that should have happened! He had a shot on target, the defenders had to get there, and then it is helped <laughs> out along. Oh, they take those, we see those, we go into OT to a piece. Grims, they're catching up, they're catching fire. One extra that'll fall wide. Jaywoo, oh, their hearts are in their throats and they've got to get themselves under control. They might. Hearts are in their throats. My throat is in the in the in the dumpster right now. Screaming <laughs> for a couple of minutes straight. I mean, the daggers continue to be thrown, like you mentioned. And we'll see. NEC now with a great chance with momentum on their side. They want to attack, and this is going to be a miss. It's going to be open. It's free. The shot falls. Oh. And Knox will well opt it out here for Josh. Will push forward as Ace will have to play in the corner awkwardly. He's red. It's behind the defender. It's in. Mega Mine will end the series in overtime in game number four. It's a 3-2 victory here in the game and a 3-1 victory in the series. That pre-jump of trust. He's like, you know what, Josh? You're throwing it. We've got Knox on our back line. Everything will be safe. Let's just go for it. Mega Mine slams through, crashes the gate, and crashes the dreams of Jaywoo having a perfect season here in the spring split. Wow, what a game four. That one woke me up, and that was for, <laughs> that's needed for yeah. the last couple of days. My goodness, <laughs> that was a showcase, and they were doing it in 3-1 fashion. Yeah, that's the perfect way to kick off the broadcast, right? And every broadcast is a great one, right? Yeah, but this one, wow, what a series to kick off. I know it was 3-1, but it definitely felt differently. And that's because Jaywoo had the lead uh, for four minutes and 55 minutes straight, actually. Yeah. Technically, five minutes and a couple seconds, however long it took to get that last goal in. I mean, that was incredible work uh, from them not giving up on trying to close out the series there. Game five, I'm not going to say it was going to be their demise, but it was uh, definitely knocking on the door of your Jaywoo. We talked about the ANSI, um, you know, we talked about the ANSI versus Nox dynamic, but Megamind comes in and, and is that support unit that you need as a leader and was a big difference maker here. Yeah, uh, Mega Mine. I think they were giving like little kind of elbows to each other out in, in the field. It looked yeah. like they were oh. trying to emulate so much of their mm -hmm. rotation, how they were doing some ball handling, and it, and it looked really, really clean. I did like it, and then it turned into a victory. So hey, congratulations over to the Grims. They're able to turn themselves, I think, into two one. I could, yep. look the, the master sheet. It's all the awesome stats. It's all the awesome names. It's everything that we could ever want. But it, regardless, win is a win. They're able to improve. A week number four is theirs over the likes of Jay Wu, and Jay Wu is going to be like, huh? All right, we maybe maybe seeing them in the playoffs. I definitely want to see a rematch of those two teams. Oh, yeah, that was dynamic from the get-go. And a, a little bit of sloppy play there in game number three. And then in game number four, they came right back out. And it was just, it was adjustments being made real time. It's very difficult to do at this level. And they were uh, they were handling it. I, I think, uh, you know, New England College handled it just a little bit better. And that's tough to say because Jaywoo, I mean, we talked about them uh, in their win over Brian Gold in, in week one, which we got to see. Um, it, it just, it was... Titan versus Titan, and, and none of them wanted to fall. Um, and New England College again off to that hot start. Oh, Monkey Man, this was your last uh, was your last cast uh, here tonight, but uh, <laughs> I know it's first and last, so uh, pretty quick uh, going. But uh, maybe you can finally catch up on some sleep. 
Hey, no. <laughs> Imagine sleeping. Look, this is college town oh, out here. I man. may not be in class, but you guys are, and that means that I have to do exactly what the kids do, right? You can't sleep. Right. <laughs> yeah. Who, who's, if the kids ain't sleeping, everyone else ain't sleeping. But you know what? We're not going to be sleeping on the competition that is coming up next. Who in the world is going to be next? You guys get to know. It's going to be the SMU Huskies White versus the Dahuji Gold. Hey, make sure you stick around. It's going to be some Challengers Northeast Division play right right after this short break.
Welcome back to the NECC Rocket League Edition here on Friday. Joining me in the booth now, we've got Galgan. Galgan, how you doing tonight, sir? Doing fantastic. It's always nice to be here on Friday evenings. Watch the best of the best and some of the rest as well, but it's all in good fun here at the NECC. That's right, and we have our next matchup, which is a, a lot more fun as well, in addition to uh, what we already have, because it's a battle of Nova Scotia, Halifax, to be exact. These two t uh, schools are right next to one another, another in Halifax, so excited to see these two teams go at it. It is SMU Huskies White facing off with Dalhousie, so let's go ahead and get to the rosters and check out who we've got on the pitch here tonight, starting with SMU and Quantum, Quantum Fiend, uh, Yusuf and Jorge coming in as freshman, junior, freshman respectively. Yeah, we can expect to see potentially someone else stepping in for SMU. Depends on how the roster shakes out, but for the time being, we know that this roster has had their fair share of struggles. A forfeit win over the UMass Minutemen in Week 3, but other than that, sweeps against them. Still yet to win a regulation or overtime game of Rocket League this season. Hoping for a change of fate here against their very neighborly opponents in Dalhousie University, specifically the Dalhousie Gold roster. We have binge won Kindy and Leota taking to the pitch for the side. Craig sitting on the bench, keeping it nice and warm, hoping the squad can get it done without him. Yeah, and, and you know, you talk about these three players and how they have experience at the college realm, and, and maybe this gives them an advantage, right? They've lived this life, the college life. Uh, they know how to balance both school and getting their practicing in, right? So uh, this is definitely by no means a team that's uh, uh, lacking experience. The other side, though, we talk about freshmen across the board for the most part, and so uh, maybe that gives them a little bit of an edge here. But, of course, both of these schools have a little bit of bragging rights on the line here. Who's actually the better team in the area? And we'll get to find out here momentarily as the two about to take the pitch here. Obviously, from previous uh, from previous seasons here, we've seen SMU plenty of times in Dalhousie as well. So, um, you know, it's time to kind of put your uh, uh, put your predictions on this game here. But we do have in game number one now between these two, who will get the bracking rights. It begins right now. So close to each other, hoping for some success. So that, you know, the the pre uh, festivity or post series festivities kick off with a bit lighter mood. But we wait to get back into the action here, assuming that some technical difficulties on the back end are holding us up from getting in. But we're right back, just like that. It's like you never even missed anything. <laughs> Haven't missed a goal either. I love it. Love to see it back into the action that quickly. And right now we see. A very quick start here from Dalhousie. They have a bit of the offensive presence. A good cut here to defender compromise. Down the shot of the bar. Another chance, but just a little bit wide. And so SMU going to dodge a couple of bullets here early. They've got to move back the other way if they can. Moving it down towards the corner, but limited somewhat. It's only the opening minute, but you look for those telltale factors about how a team's going to push through the offensive zone, aggress into the situation. SMU haven't had too much of a lane. It is all on them to carve it out for themselves, and that's just what Jorge looks to do, but no connection down from the ceiling. It was a good effort to be fair, but it all falls apart towards the middle of the field again, and Dalhousie yet another push look. Yeah, and Ben uh, Benchua was on the back end of the post trying to you know find a, a soft spot in the defense. And now it's a bit of an issue here for SMU positionally because the chance and the shot could be knocked down. The opportunity of the second time Leota's going to break through. Delhousie the first to strike. Feels like for this Dalhousie Gold squad, it was a matter of time for the goal to be scored. Forcing two defenders up, Jorge the third and final. Not quick enough on the draw to get off the ground, but you don't necessarily put too much blame on any one person in the situation. It's a team effort at every stage of the game, every area of the field. And for the SMU Huskies, a bit more work to be done on the goal line. Scrappy situation, Dalhousie see themselves in front. And you can credit Dalhousie as well. This gold team does a good job of putting the defense in an awkward position, right, where they're just kind of diving at it um, and, and just placing the ball behind defenders. It makes it very difficult, right? Having to chase that down and you feel awkward for a second, it's tough to get those rotations back, get in the binds of your opponents. And that's what Dalhousie gold has been able to do. Is that pass going to be there? But uh, the angle was not found by the support man. Right back to it they go. Can he get a pop high? Try to challenge the back wall as Yusuf was up for it as well. Uh, no success there trying to push in. This one will challenge the box, but Jorge able to get the clear out the center. And SMU can finally breathe here looking for the equalizer. 
As this game develops, however, midfield line is going to be so important for SMU to gain control of. They've let this one dribble all the way through. Surely, no, it is saved away. I was starting to think that that one would end in all the way. And of course, that would be the chance for SMU to knock on the door and equalize this game. But they really are facing some hard adversity and struggles here in the middle of the field. Dalhousie have very solid control. They've rotated well, given each other space, made sure not to double up on any unnecessary plays. But speaking of, you get a little too close for comfort and the shot loses its efficiency as a result. SMU, this could be their ticket through. It's a nice shot from Youssef, but two defenders collide to save away the initial strike. And you can kind of feel out exactly how this game is going to go. You'll see SMU like to push, stretch the pitch. Dalhousie will take their time, right? They'll pop high, just like you see right here, right? And, and kind of set up, let the play come to them, and then uh, change up the pace quickly because they can still have that speed. And the fact that Dalhousie has been able to show kind of a, a changing back and forth of their pacing and being able to control the pace definitely gives them advantage here, especially when you have players like this with their mechanics. It's Leota to strike again. And it'll be 2-0 now. Nothing very slow on the pace about this opportunity. Leota had that read all the way calculated through. And Youssef, who, for all intents and purposes, has been the player from SMU to try and get up to the backboard before the ball bounces out. You have to admire the gumption to go for a touch like that. But it's one of the more difficult ones to read. And that slipped through. That one tiny mistake from SMU gives Leota the green light. And Dalhousie the second goal. Make it three. Kindy rips it from the top of the field. Yeah, anybody can get into the Goal scoring here for Dalhousie. You can tell that it's basically next man up and just being able to, to bury it should you have the opportunity, should it arise. And outside the box is where you want to have ball possession here. The midfield control for Dalhousie continues to be a problem here for SMU, who have yet to clean up some gameplay. Luckily for them, though, it's game number one. They'll have some time to settle, but they'd like to get a couple of goals here to really prove to SMU that they can hang in this battle of Halifax. But Dalhousie keeps going to work. It's starting to feel like this has run away. I mean, I, I think we can put a nice little a nice little check mark in the win column for game number one at this point for Dalhousie. They haven't really shown too much that would suggest it would slip away in the final 60 seconds, but stranger things have happened in the realm of Rocket League, so I won't discount it just yet. For the time being, though, Dalhousie, they have certainly shown one of the best ways to open up a Rocket League series. Just kind of make your mark stamp your impression into the grass of the field and make everybody know your name because dalhousie not going away well people are going to know leota's name for sure after that uh you know showing of mechanics the ability to create plays and finish them more importantly right and so you know you love making a name for yourself but at the end of the day it's going to take the full team effort to get through smu once they start cleaning some of the defensive rotations up i think they'll be a challenging team to play against but right now they just haven't been able to show that challenge quite yet so Again, they had struggles earlier in the season, too, and so uh, Galgan, again, it'll be up to how strong is their mental. And right there was an opportunity, but again, unfortunately, it'll go by the wayside. And let's not discount that this is still week four. Teams are still somewhat figuring out exactly how they want to play and attack the rest of the season. But as far as the rest of this series is concerned, first game done and dusted. Clean sheet almost secured, but the shot not strong enough. And Dalhousie do see it through with a four-goal differential. Man, uh, just... I mean, how much of a difference maker can you be? Like, there's, uh, I don't want to call it a carry, because at the college level, especially at Challengers level here at NECC, uh, it's very tough to do that. But uh, just that type of dynamic nature from Leota to, to really bring that conversation around in the first place. So definitely love what uh, what Leota's doing right now, and uh, we'll see if it can continue here. SMU's got some work to do. They're rough around the edges right now, but uh, again, with an established program like they've had, they've been around the NECC for a while, they've known it, they've lived it. They've been here before, uh, so they definitely have the knowledge of what they need to do, what they need to correct. It's just a matter of can we get it done. And in the context of these rosters and this specific Challengers Northeast division, you look at these two teams, SMU coming in with a technical 1 and 2, Dalhousie coming in with a technical 0 and 1, and you might think that's a bit odd to be 0 and 1 heading into week 4. That's off the back of a no-report series that we can only assume was potentially, maybe, possibly played in week 2 against Thomas Black, <laughs> and a rescheduled game that they have yet to play against the QU Golden Gales 
in week number three. So I'm not too sure that you can back Dalhousie being 0-1 right now. I don't want to say that I think they have won their week two matchup and will win their week three matchup, but they certainly come in as the stronger team on paper, despite the fact that their record does not indicate that. Sure, I, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely go with that, especially when they're able to jump out in 10 seconds off the kickoff there. And Benjuan was uh, jealous and said, I didn't get on the score sheets in the first game. I got to get one in here. And uh, it wasn't anything too impressive. It wasn't a Leota goal. But, uh, you know, sometimes you need that solid third to put in the goals that you really uh, need. The fundamentals, if you will. When everybody gets a piece of the offensive pie, you know the team is at least somewhat successful. And Dalhousie have put in five in a row now. Everybody's got at least one. It's all good to see. Another center pass leads to another shot and another little double there from the SMU defenders. So plenty of work on their plate. More food left to be devoured if they are to feast at the end of this meal. Youssef, who had one of the closer looks for SMU towards the end of game one, denied yet again here as I'm noticing a trend here in the Fennec designs Ooh. hopefully able to do a bit more defending here for SMU yeah they need to get out and challenge Leota sooner because that was very close to being a, a Lion Blaze-esque type 45 flick to the top shelf just a little bit off the mark so challenges need to come earlier for SMU you can't let them have this space that's the reason why they've been able to uh, to have the high level of scoring they have Right, and so now you see Kendi right back at it too with the shot a little bit high. The follow up there too, and just the rotations continuously allow them to strike one after another, and they're up 2-0. And those rotations bear the fruits of the shots that they take on target, and it works almost akin to a stun of sorts against SMU. Yeah. If they're not proactive enough defensively, they get caught watching the ball hit their backboard, and their eyes are taken off of the next attacker in line for Dalhousie that's right in front of the net about to rip a shot into there. So there's not much you can do as the defense when, again, you lose that proactivity, but perhaps more importantly, you end up blind to the follow-up shot. Yeah, and you have to be aware at all times and in, in, in match the pace. We talked about Dalhousie and, and, and how they play really quickly. SMU seemed to start off that way, but they've kind of fallen off a little bit. And that's because they've SMU's tried to slow down and match Dalhousie whenever they do take a breather, take a second, right, and, and really digest what's in front of them to make the right play. And that one float back, a little bit dangerous there for Dalhousie. The follow-up chance, though, will be shielded there from the Dalhousie goal defense. Yusuf will try to push back in the zone, but it's no use. As the midfield presence continues here, another touch from Leota to set up Kendi. And he'll start some offense here. And challenge Yusuf. Again, a bit of just not knowing when to commit for these challenges from SMU. It's been haunting them since the get-go. And this one, a shot on target. The chance right back down. Nobody on it, and the fall from Kendi will go. Dalhousie continues to be on this streak. And all of these sequences stemming from the last one that we saw from Dalhousie defensively dealing with a rather tricky ball to collect at the near post. I feel like it's a byproduct of another issue that we see with SMU is the respect that they're giving to Dalhousie right now. You obviously, you know, as a as a grand scheme thing, respect in the very literal sense, you want to give it to your opponents at all times, but at sometimes you've got to bring the hammer down, you've got to shoot quickly, that's exactly what Yusef realizes here off of the very gracious pass, and finally, SMU, find the net. Yeah, that was a good uh, thing to build off of, is the fact that Yusuf saw all the defenders, their last touch, and nobody back, uh, shot had to go low. And the fact that Yusuf did hit that, I know it looked simple, but when you're down and you know that you've been bested through a game and a half, right, it's uh, and get in your head, and you might lack a little bit of confidence there, but that was the right place in, placement from Yusuf. Sure, it could have went a little bit more uh, towards the left side of the net to free up some space, but... I mean, at the same time, to execute that is a good sign for SMU uh, if they want to start building something against their rivals from Nova Scotia. But this, an Ooh. opportunity through the box and out here for SMU as they continue this run. Tough one there. Jorge didn't quite buy into Yusef getting the centering pass, went for the bump instead and thought Yusef would be the shooter. Again, I don't know how much blame I put in that particular situation because if any one player is going to spur the SMU comeback, I feel like it has to be Yusef at this point. But getting everybody else into the equation, Jorge and Blur here, who have been in comparison quite dormant to Yusef. Getting them in the equation will Ooh. certainly step up SMU's threat level, but Dalhousie continue to scrap away. It's a bit of a controlled chaos, if you will, from Dalhousie. SMU has 
You know, the Huskies have really challenged their defense, and yet Dalhousie holds strong in a majority of these opportunities. It's, you know, if, if we need to make a desperation save, we do, but then we get back on track. And now a pass down the field, a chance to connect. Oh, it was beautiful, but just a little bit wide on the shot. But he saw the uh, the connection one two from Dalhousie trying to uh, to make those big plays happen. And that time, Leota became a playmaker rather than the goal scorer. Although they do try to get another shot off here, they use it to collect here. Dalhousie still making plays even when SMU comes at them. You can see the versatility for everybody from Dalhousie, but especially Leota. We call him out so much. Kindy as well. Shot power has been stepping up as the series has gone on, and it's another bad omen for SMU if Kindy keeps launching shots like this. Yeah, from from the angle that seemed impossible. You're right. That was. Uh, Pretty tough, and he was able to bury it. So accuracy on point, number one for Dalhousie. They're passing on point as well. And so just all the aspects that you need in a good offensive game, plus the saves they've been able to make and get back on track, is just it just feels insurmountable for SMU currently. And so it's going to take a big you know, difference maker. It's going to take a big uh, play here, maybe a couple here from SMU to really give them a shot here in the series. And the issue goes twofold, again, because as much as you want to just keep scoring goals and, and abide by the saying that the best defense is a good offense, SMU are staring down the fact that they've conceded eight goals over two games before the second is even over. So something has to be shored up here on the back ranks in order to slow Dalhousie down. It obviously comes with a bit more proactive play as well to make sure these shots don't end up on target as that one redirects towards the woodwork, but away as Yusef gets one last carry. No final goal though however this ball at the middle of the field surely hits the ground Dalhousie not a clean sheet this time but nonetheless a dominant game and three match points to deal with yeah SMU had had their opportunities there's been a few times you know when we talk about matchups especially in rivalries where uh you know the bragging rights can be right off the bat in, in favor of one and in the goal column which is what matters most so let's be honest here um you know, it has been favoring Dalhousie in that way. But for SMU, I feel like they have like little pieces that they can build off of. The problem is they just haven't been able to finish. So for me, I think it's uh, just execution here. Get back to the drawing board. Uh, play a little bit more uh, fundamental. I think they're getting ahead of their, themselves. They want to stretch the pitch. They've been trying to do that since the get-go, but it's just not working for you. You got to settle down. You got to play a little bit of defense, calm down, find the outlet pass, but not going for the uh, for the jugular, if you will. Don't go for the, the kill. Very uh, you know, right off the bat. You can slow it down whenever you gain that position and then find the most methodical way to move down the field. I couldn't agree more because it's one thing to ask SMU to make some constant adjustments here, as you expect from most teams, but it does feel like a breakdown into the more fundamental sense is what SMU will benefit most from in this series because Dalhousie, they haven't necessarily gone for incredibly flashy, you know, moves themselves. We've seen it a couple of times from Leota, but for the most part, it's been very calm, calculated plays from the defensive half, waiting for SMU to play the ball into the their own cars, and then striking while the iron is hot. For SMU, getting back to basics here, shoring up all their lines, as I said, defensively, offensively, middle of the field, 50s, a little bit of everything is what's going to work. And Yusuf showing some speed there. We'll beat a 50-50 out, but again, a couple of people a little bit too far forward, right? For Jorge, for us backwards and into his own position here as third man back. Benjois tries to push forward. A bit of a mistouch here. A chance there, but luckily for SMU, Benjois ju just could not find the right angle to toss it over to a teammate, especially when Leota could have been there available in the midfield. But he'll look to push forward, try to get the pinch. Good defense from Jorge. And Yusuf with a great pass right back to him to connect. SMU looking pretty clean with their passes right now. He's got to be worried about that Dalhousie uh, uh, ability to, to push right back at him. And what helps the image here of SMU and what also hurts Dalhousie's ability to counter quickly is that SMU get to the middle of the field very fast. It is so crucial for oh, yeah. teams to be able to do that because it's too easy. We know low rank lobbies love to send this ball towards the corner and just push it up the sidewall until it, you know, rattles around right in front of the net. These teams are going to be primed and ready to defend something like that. So if SMU can get things centralized quickly and give themselves a little bit of space in that prime shooting lane, 
lane, their chances are going to start looking a lot more threatening a lot quicker as a beautiful touch away from Yusef there, likely a save, keeps this game scoreless. Sure does. Leota trying to change that. Been a goal scorer early in game number one. Popped off with a hat trick and looking to perhaps land another one in this column, but it has been a defensive struggle so far. Look at Jorge, far side and in, SMU take a lead. And that was a queen play by Jorge, trying to crank some offense here on the SMU side. Let's talk about making your name heard, Jorge. Well done, well played. Solid opportunity in the last touch to send it. Far corner for good measure, away from the defense. SMU have life breathed into them here in game number three for the first time this series grab themselves a lead and just like that kindy takes it right on back yeah and uh so you can't sleep especially right off the kickoff right the last thing you needed was a kickoff goal and jorge almost read that too i know it's a difficult save to make especially when you're off that kickoff but uh that's one you gotta make it's so tough to give up that goal dalhousie now right back on track and in fact right off the kickoff themselves have this possession but they didn't trust that Blur was actually going to miss that one, so no harm done for SMU. Served as a bit of a fake. Next it's a player, shot. Yeah. It's a player that we're expecting to see. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just All good. I'm fixated on Blur right now and, and wanting to see the impact right here. A true middle ground player off the ball presence is surely strong, but I I'm curious to see the, the true impact because it may not show up on the scoreboard, but they certainly are going to have to call Blur's name sooner rather than later. Yeah, it's been inevitable. Unfortunately, it has not happened. And so, you know, you keep keep looking, and, and hopefully something is created here. You have the lead, too. So, you know, you want to get pretty... You don't want to get comfortable, in a way. And Juan, try to challenge here. Try to go box and through. Jorge back on it, too. Established offensive presence. Something they've needed. The fundamentals there. Another shot. The defensive Dalhousie able to answer that one, at least for now. This will fall back into the hands of SMU, who tries to push forward. And a couple of touches here, the shot! And again, save there from Yusuf to keep it alive, or keep it out. Uh, Benjuan tries to get to it too. Blur, unfortunately, could not get to that challenge. From the back wall, Jorge trying to escape the zone. We play Pong back and forth here, a minute 44 remaining. And it's quick transitions for Dalhousie, again, getting a little bit more antsy on the back line. As we saw, they were keen to let that one go all the way through before they finally take their push and, again, try and be as calculated as possible. But we're finally getting to see this Dalhousie Gold Squad attempt to win a game from the late moments. We haven't seen it in this series thus far. It's a bit more desperation, but again, still Ooh. calm, cool, collected is Leota all the way. This one jumps in front, but Binjuan has too many bombs. Bodies in front to commit to the play. Now Leota goes through trying to be as fast as humanly possible or carly possible. That's not going to happen yet. Final 60 seconds still tied up at one. Leota still can't get it through. Listen, I love the push that SMU is making here, but this can't be your final push, right? Because Dalhousie is too good at putting the ball in the back of the net in this series. So you have to be able to finish one of these drives, right? You can't just be your last ditch effort. The last ditch effort can't come until after a game number five. You have to get the reverse sweep. But right now, it's ticking down to 38 seconds left. They've had a majority of opportunities, yes. But the more time that takes down, the better chance goes in the hands of Dalhousie, who's trying to push in now. But a good clear here from Burr, Blur, rather, will try and push to the corner to get around this defense. Now a chance to the box it goes. Leota stays calm, holds onto it, left in a 1v1. Yusuf needs a challenge a little bit late. Jorge with a great job to take it out from the backside. And only about 10 seconds remaining, counting down. Dalhousie scrambling for one last shot on Blur with another touch away. Leota sends back two in the center. They both oh. jump up to either of them have the shot. They do, but it's just wide. And for the first time, SMU, they've got to be glad to get to OT, but they've got to win it here. That's right. They need this next goal, and the more time that goes by, the more you feel like Dalhousie has it, especially when they're up and trying to make this read. They do get the touch away. A blur. How oh, good. Owlwood pass, but it's red. What a read there. An anticipation from Dalhousie just making it difficult in every instance for SMU to do anything. And Blur with the miss, yeah, but luckily Jorge able to clean that up. But still Dalhousie can have an opportunity here. Missing the shot, though. Uncharacteristic of Dalhousie. And SMU won't be able to thank their lucky stars. They weren't able to convert this. And now a chance. Yusuf, a shot. What a save from Leota to get up and make that one happen. 
Nothing would be more poetic than SMU winning the game off of an opportunity like that because Dalhousie had so many plays strung together where the leading defender from SMU missed the ball, and yet Dalhousie couldn't find it. That last touch icing on a very unfortunate cake for them not to score. And SMU with their first attack, they look threatening enough. Ooh. Second attack sends on target from high into the middle of the field. So all of a sudden, SMU, while they may not have held on to the ball for the majority of this OT, every single time they push towards target, they look like they could extend the series. Seems like SMU has found uh, the sniper rifle on the map, all right? They've been able to finally find a little bit of that accuracy from distances that uh, hadn't been found before. So you toss on that scope, and hopefully for them it's a longer scope in terms of uh, time of the series. But Dalhousie trying to end it now, and they've had opportunities to do so in the past. That, Yusuf. Had to be careful, went off the side of his car, but luckily for them, they'll get possession back. The shot, wide open, it's in! Candy will win it in overtime for Dalhousie Gold, and they will be the winner this time of the Halifax Battle. Who else from that same position to just rip one through? It arguably isn't the strongest of shots, bounces on the way in, but the important factor, nobody from SMU in the zip code of that goal, let alone the zip code of Halifax during that play, unable to get the save away. And I can tell there are going to be two very different vibes in the post-match celebration at Alexander Keith's, one of the local bars there in Halifax, for those of you who don't know. But Love it. We'll see. Obviously, I mean, great to watch both of these rosters progress. I'll wait to see the rest of the results for Dalhousie Gold rolling in because they convinced me they have the clutch factor. They have the ability to stomp out games. A little bit of everything is always par for the course with Dalhousie. Good on you for winning this series. Yeah, and they uh, have brought the heat to an otherwise cold location there in Nova Scotia. So, uh, I mean, congrats goes out to those guys. I know they've been working hard for it, and so uh, definitely earned and deserved this win in every sense of the word. For SMU, it's back to the drawing board. Uh, this hasn't been your best season yet, but that's okay, right? You, you're still a young program looking to build, find uh, you know, find the right way to play, find your identity, and still not too late for that squad. So uh, not too concerned for SMU moving forward. There's obviously some things they can clean up, yes, but they showed hard at the end, uh, showed that they were going to make it a battle until the very end of it. You've got to back them to at least grab one game, and hopefully a series as the season goes on. They've still got five weeks of regular season play, so I don't think either of us are too concerned. But yep. that is going to wrap things up for that second match. We have a jam-packed night tonight, Bear Light, and this third match, Emergence South Division, UARC Midnight Black versus the UHD Gators, hopefully entertains in just the same way, but I take it this is your signing off for the evening. So please, without further ado. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you all for everybody coming out, hanging out with us on a Friday night. There's no other place that we'd rather be here but in at the NECC watching some Rocket League. So a big shout out to and, uh, and Galkin. Good to join you in the booth as always. But yes, that next matchup that Galkin mentioned will be right here on this channel. So don't go anywhere. You're watching the NECC. Welcome everyone to the NECC Highlighted Week number three, where we bring you all the action from the previous week that you might have missed. My name's Orbital, and you know what it is, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Here's the highlights of this week's play. Purple set up the Devil Sentinel instead of the Devil Duel instead of Ill and I, so let's see how that matchup goes considering that it's made for that, and the Sentinel's the one who comes out of first. Oh, oh wow, two, three! Oh my goodness! Where the attackers are looking for. Andrew Fury being sent exactly. out. To try oh, to stop the two huge kills! Person advantage, although Nades get a swing out, finds that kill onto Cycle. The time not great. Series jobs jump! And on their own is only able to take one before falling. A quick, is there and a quick? now a drop. A more util means it's open, but he shoots through the box and quick. Said quick with the quick trigger finger takes a 3k. Cold finds quick. Still looking for one more. Plant goes down. Shells go out and actually stop the plant, so that's more than enough. Cold flushing out egg. Looking for one more at least. Go around the corner. You get the headshot. Cold, what are you doing? You are a monster. Can you clutch this up? Can you clutch this up? 32 HP on one, and you do. Oh. It's still up top. It is all up to Wet Sock to get that diffuser. They take down Joe Glowstoner. You stay prone. You win the game. No. No, what is he and doing? And it's Gonzaba! Is Wet Sox is upstairs doing whatever. There is no getting the diffuser down in this scenario. One shot on the mirror. Oh. Down. Glowstoner is gone. No Inside way. of blue remains that. Oh. Yada, and he gets it. Picked up as it'll be sole point now for Arcadia. 
Paranoia used, diving on in, looking on to enemy 80 carry. King Moron's still alive, but not for long as Heimer gets that kill. And now it's Reset City. Heimer looking for more. It's a triple kill for the Darius. His ghost is not quite up, but Renata W helps him out plenty. Lands the hook, make it a quadra kill for the Darius. Blood in the water, he wants this pentakill. And the stun lands, he lands the E, exhaust goes down, looking for the kill. Top side, very important, Leon got the shutdown on Fungus Dungus. Indeed he did. Under the turret though is not a good place to be because two kills going over to Diffinator. Leon V9 turns around. He's gonna take someone with him. Never mind. But I think he knows that it's, there's just there's no opportunity he gets out of this one alive. He's going in. He doesn't care. He fucking oh! steal though. That's huge. Immediately gonna peel back so UMT do get tr double knocked up. But the root comes out and then a three man stun into the fiddle ulti. It is the wombo combo of dreams. Fire strike to combo with his in the fire strike scorches hammer. But Quicks lays down a slim euphoria in the front line as Quicks swings for the fences and comes up with a quad. Quicks to lay it down. Hopefully RPI are going to see that there's no Ryan in the front line. Oh, but they don't. Three gets stunned. Luckily the immortality field is there, but it matters not. The dead eye cleans house in the back line. Isaac Pro opts in a play off this year. Good call off there is now. It's another touch towards the midfield. A soft one of the tires is going to drop it back down. He's going to find the second touch. <laughs> Staples, are you kidding me? And uh, yeah, I mean, I like that 50 there in the midfield. Actual one by contest. Mizzou. Yes, actual contest, actual physicality on the ball. And that sets up the goal Teamwork. right there. From Little now it's going oh, back the no. other way. Open up on the other side. Oh, oh, it's the same way. No it's way. from going in. Of course, even with all the highlights, there are just some funny moments that we've had throughout the week, so let's not forget them as well. Here's some of the funnier moments, some of the unfortunate moments, and just straight up silly. Here are the miscleeks of week three. Oh, what, what, what kind of fake a little present here? Yeah, there was no fakes at all. It was all just, oh, no, Jules, what are you doing? All the oh, way around, what a swing. Do they bruh, find bruh. him? They can't quite get it no. on target. <laughs> they just won't pick up a gun. It doesn't matter. Side of Kataba and... They gotta convert off of that. Ooh. Yeah, I don't think you can throw that up there. Yeah, that was the same spot. Please don't do it again. Oops. Come on, man. Round three. Jupiter, Jupiter, come on. Please don't put it there again. Round four. Jupiter, Jupiter, please stop, man. Can't get it in. What well, done, buddy? Oh, still up. Take it back and oh. take the own goal. <laughs> Hey, it goes in and we take those. Nothing wrong with that. And that concludes week number three. Week number four will be kicking off with Valorant once again on Monday at 5 p.m. EST. So make sure not to miss all the action. Thank you so much for tuning in to the NECC Highlighted.
seconds, and oh my goodness, take it. My mic is awful. Okay. Never mind. There we go. Never it's all mind. good. We'll, we'll get things situated. No worries. Let's fix it. Buy a little bit of time to get that ready to go. Oh, what a way to kick things off. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're still waiting. I can't hear you through Discord at this point, so we'll we'll wait, I guess, until I can hear you as well. There we go. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, what a way to kick things off. Hey, oh, okay. All right. So we're still getting set up on VMAX. Hi, welcome everybody to the NECC Friday night action. This is the third match of the evening. If you can believe it, we've been here all this time and we are finally ready to bring you the University of Arkansas Midnight Black up against the University of Houston downtown Gators here in Emergence South Division. My name Galgan alongside me Relic and Relic. I think we have you now. Yeah, well, hold on just a second. So, Relic is going to reconnect here. <laughs> oh. We, we Still nothing? What? Something? Something. Okay, to be fair, four, <laughs> four Storm Warriors had us, like, already all hooked up for, like, the last ten minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Chaos ensues. But to be fair, my mic disconnecting uh, definitely has vibes of... You are Midnight Black. Hey, oh, segue into the team. Oh. These guys, look, I know it's shade. We're throwing them under the bus, but it's true, Galgan. Week one, a loss, 3-0 against Mizzou Club B. It's not the end of the world. A lot of teams start off their split with a 0-3 loss. But week two, forfeit. Week three, forfeit. We thought they might forfeit again, Galgan. But at least they are here. I am Zoom in the Beast and the incredibly named Jerry Quacker taking to the field today. <laughs> we certainly hope that Arkansas can keep their tech issues under the rug for this series that they are about to play against their opponents on the other side of the pitch. The University of Houston downtown Gators. What a aptly <laughs> toned <Such> Gator <laughs> that is in the logo. But we have Mission to Pluto, Orange Blood, and Into Entropy. A lot of fantastic usernames in this particular matchup, but I'm curious to see who the difference maker will be for these incredibly ripped Gators. It's, it's images like that that make you question a lot of things, Gal. Good night. He's, <laughs> quite, he's quite the strapping Gator, let's say. But it's not about the logo. It's about the team behind it. And these guys are on a tear. Three and oh, they've only dropped two games up until this point. To say that they are overwhelming favorites would be something of an understatement, but really, we can't gauge uh, Arkansas too strongly at the moment because they have only played one series. And given the fact that we were, we were, we were thinking, oh, it might be a bit touch and go here, it's because of technical issues once again. And so, if they actually suffered with those technical issues in week number one and are only now just getting them resolved, then for all we know, they could have been playing handicapped in week number one. It's uh, it's an open field. Uh, and speaking of the field, let's head on to it, Galgan. You are Midnight Black up against the UHD Gators. It's match number three here on the NECC Friday. We all know that the open field must be populated by the cars about to play. And it'll be interesting to watch this series develop in a paper lineup that you would expect the UHD Gators to dominate. Again, UARC Midnight, a bit of an unknown quantity for this particular series. So they could do well by themselves to jumping off on the right foot here. But I'm sure the Gators will like to do the same as first 30 seconds come and go. No real blood drawn on either side. And honestly, that's the best start that UARC Midnight could have hoped for us. At the very least, you're coming off the back of effectively nine losses in the row if we're going to take those forfeits seriously. Just don't concede. I know it sounds easier said than done, of course, but a strong defense is the foundation upon which you're going to build the rest of this series. So not conceding in the first minute is certainly a good start. Although, unfortunately, before we did reach that minute, they did concede. And it's just a little bit of wayward defense here they move up a little too far they leave that near post wide open entropy 
Is fun fact, Galgan, is that he rarely touches grass, but he's only got a good touch of the ball there. One oh gators. Certainly didn't have to grab very many particles, or not particles, blades of grass. There's the word I'm looking for in that aerial jump for the goal. Also worth noting, Joe Wow L O L taking to the pitch here for the side of the UHD Gators. That fourth player we didn't mention on the lineup, and we'll see just how much of an impact this Furia bound octane has. Hopefully, more of an impact than Furia themselves in the regional today. Hey! Oof, that is a solid yikes, folks, but no more solid yikes in terms of that UARC Midnight defense doing pretty solidly, although this is going to reach the back of a waterfall pass down. Up comes Jay Well underneath Jerry Quacker, completely misread the play, jumped up and was predicting a shot that didn't come until maybe another couple of seconds down the road. All off. Oh, that's one of those triple commit shots that uh, one of our good friends, Finner, would definitely clip from the RLCS. <laughs> Not one that the Midnight folks are going to look back on with much kindness or, uh, or or fondness, let's say. It's 2-0 Gators, and now we're starting to see the worry of not finding possession downfield. That play is the byproduct of one of those situations where everybody on the field sort of gets a rough idea of where the ball is headed. They draw the line in their mind, try to execute, and everybody just scrambles towards what ends up being the goal for the Gators. So they're happy to take it, to be sure. They found some fairly scrappy ones here. Not too many open play situations for either team, but for UARC Midnight, while the situations have not come easy for them, they have to capitalize what they are given because it has not been very much at at all the Gators, oppressive in every sense of the word on offense, entropy with another. Yeah, emergence, of course, the second division from bottom, but we do see some nice plays like this. Entropy, it's a bit of a collateral damage there, and because you've already removed one defender from the goal mouth, of course, simple math tells you that maximum you're only going to be dealing with two, and it's a nice shot place there. Although that said, straight off the rip, they almost lose one at kickoff. Bit of a chaotic pinch here over into the blue half once again, but that's really the point I want to make again, Gal. We've been spending so much time of this particular game in the blue half, but I can't remember a single shot, maybe aside from that one off kickoff, where Midnight Black UARC have actually looked like scoring. It's half time. I imagine that their shot count is possibly two, three at most. I have to agree, and I think it all comes down to Midnight pushing the advantage that they have when they get those opportunities. It's it's always about that for every single team jumping on the jumping on the rip as soon as you're given the look. But in chances like here, where you've got one beat, you start to snowball that advantage and for UARC Midnight it doesn't look like they're keen to jump on that. They just kind of wait for the ball to come back at them at the midfield line. Meanwhile the Gators are sitting on their own back ranks trying to scramble, pick up resources and for all intents and purposes they should be jumped on but Midnight just not too keen to push that advantage when they have it. So he goes through the corner once again, navigates his way past the beast. Jerry Quacker over the top of one, but sadly not able to find the beast who was on that escapee run looking towards it. That was a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a sussy shot there. I think it was more of a cross than a shot, but was ending up on target. Had to deal with it. They're still not dealing with it as the clearance doesn't come through. That's on target. In it goes off the post. Entropy offered a freebie. If this game had ended 3-0, Galgan, I'd say there was actually quite a bit of hope going into game number two, given how much worse it could have been. Mm -hmm. Now it is starting to get into that much worse territory. Four, five, six goals conceding, none scored. Yeah, it's not pretty reading. And what adds to that is not only the climbing score total, but the manner in which these goals are scored. It stemmed from a pretty massive defensive miss. Granted, the Gators aren't exactly shooting the ball as quickly and as effectively as they could, they don't really need to be. Midnight, again, have extended that hesitant play into their own defensive end, need to be faster on the jump, and that is a good shot to get you going. Yeah, pace is certainly something that this Midnight Black team is lacking uh, in, in spades, unfortunately, and a lot of the pace advantage comes into the midfield line for the UHD Gators. So many times they're able to pre-jump or pre-read and win a challenge which is immediately transitioning into an attack phase given how quick they are to the ball great communication from all three players and for arkansas at this stage a goal would be something nice to go home with but it would certainly only be a consolation are they going to find it through this play we'll see 30 seconds remaining trying to devolve where this ball comes from out of the corner midfield line it stays there for the time being nice shot on target 
target could have been in. But the placement right into oh. the lone defender to save it away. Another centering pass block designed. The UHD Gators get their clear through. Will they get one for themselves to add to the tally? Seems like we get back to that neutral state. We want something here from Arkansas to take with them for the road. The long journey ahead to game number two. They've kept this one relevant in the zone, but nobody jumps to it in time. The Gators happily let that one drop to preserve the clean sheet. And that final 30 seconds for me really does tell a story in of itself. So many opportunities that came the way uh, against UAH Black. And, and that's okay. That's fine. They did concede four. But how many times did we see them cross that midfield line? Mm -hmm. Not as many as you would like, sure. But when they did get past it, I, honestly, I've not been that impressed by the Gators defense. I think there are some some chinks in the armor to expose but you're not going to expose the chink if the knight is able to turn to the side and cover up the issue before you fired off the arrow so really it is just a pace differential it is a speed diff in this case and i think just by virtue of giving yourself a little bit more of an oomph in your passes and in your clearances that will cause the Gators problems. I'm, I'm interested to see whether they do make the adjustment for game two, if they're even able to make that adjustment, of course. It's very akin, however, to what we saw in the previous series, uh, which I was watching where game one was as well a 4-0 result. And the attacking team, the Gators in this case, more so not needing to play defense because their best defense is the strong offense. So you're right to have reservations about the Gators. I have some of the same about how well they will be able to defend if a strong opportunity comes their way but by that same product i can remember maybe two solid shots there for arkansas on target and they did end up in the general area of the lead defender for the gators so they're able to scramble the gators defensively for the time being we'll see if that adjustment is made however into game two i'm very curious as well to see that develop because the ball for very much, you know, all of what it's worth is in Arkansas's court to be more aggressive with pick up the pace. They have to be able to do that to advance further in this series. The thing about Rocket League is that no matter how simple the game is, the meta always continues to evolve. We went from your basic 1v1, everyone out from themselves sort of situation to the set roll era where we had anchors where we had strikers where we had box to box threats to the era of total rotation where all responsibility is placed on all players no matter who you are if you're a striker hey guess what you got to learn how to learn well, you got to learn how to play defense eventually and now we're starting to move into an era where it's more about the tactics and how you set yourself up as a team galgan for me it feels like arkansas wants to be one of those teams that's in your face and has a lot of possession in the final third but the issue's getting there in the first place. And to be fair, that's a, a, a problem that a lot of teams do have. Uh, but are they going to be able to solve that conundrum within the space of this series? Of course, there's another five minutes on the clock. So we'll see what they've got up there up their sleeve on this occasion. Gators certainly not happy to let Arkansas even move past midfield at this point. And that thematic stays true here into game number two. Played right into the hands. Mission to Pluto. Welcome to the game. Find yourself demoed within the first 50 seconds as subbing in for the Gators to try and go. make a difference. But the only difference made is that Arkansas are finally on the scoreboard. There you go. Wow, lol. That's a Wow. oh no. More like as he misses that backboard touch, it lands perfectly to the beast and fair play to him. Gets that shot away with power, away from the keeper as well. It's exactly the sort of start that Arkansas were looking for. And hey, what do you know? As soon as they've got themselves set up on the edge of the box, they can fire away those shots and they are going to get some goals. Here's another one into the center, dealt with. But look at this. I mean, to be fair, that's a, a somewhat missed touch that's actually turned into a great transitional attack on target. Oh, up goes Mr. Ooh. Peace and well. It's the beast that ends up coming back down. No burgers, but either going to flip the scoreline gators. Oh, my word. Another beastly save coming through. And I have to say, some of the misses to be expected for the Emergence Division's players, you know that the consistency is likely to be the key point for both of these teams' efficiency on both offense and defense. But some of the touches we've been seeing, the passing plays, subverting my expectations in the best possible way for Emergence-style players. They have eyes for each other down 
on the field. And as this series continues to progress, especially if the Gators continue to dilly-dally and uh, keep this one-goal deficit against them without equalizing, the passing plays are going to become that much more important because as much as you like to be able to clip on all of your opponents, oftentimes you can't get it done alone. And J-O Wow Lol is going to be very happy for this pass received right in the middle of the goal. It's a nice read, actually, and he, he somewhat redeems himself having been the villain of the story for their own conceded goal. A goal that was definitely doing Arkansas a lot of justice because they could sit off the ball, they could react a little bit more in defense, but eventually you've got to get proactive because, once again, the pace of the gate is too much for that Midnight Black defense to deal with. You can see them getting torn apart, and once again, the gate is starting to re-establish a midfield dominance, getting some demos off as well. I am still scared if I'm Arkansas. Now to find another away from the kickoff scenario, going to be a very difficult task from here on out. Oh, what a read. It's a good demo to find, however, though, to open up some space as there was an unfortunate backflip, I believe, from Jerry Quacker at the beginning of that sequence, so unable to get the clear that they wanted, but still establishing a bit of pressure. But again, you see that sit back towards the midfield line, and they see a clear over their heads. Everybody has to go back, and now it's another scramble. Triple commit on the goal line, but fortunately, Orange Blood, I say fortunately for Arkansas, very unfortunate for the Gators, has allowed this one to leak back into the zone. So transition play really starting to become a key facet for for this series back and forth we go looking for the effective placement of these passes just that but a miss on the shot through oh, watch out there's still more to come from the gators dealt with for now by the uark defense orange blood gives it up and is orange blood again off the back or they're peppering it but with not too much direction towards the net bit of a whiffington central city state there as here comes jwow on the return through the corner he's waiting but there's a touch away into the midfield once again mission to pluto decided to reset this back to square one the gators hitting their head against the wall but what's the material made out of here's another shot opportunity the double oh. tap oh jwow indeed excuse me talk about the expectations of emergence players received very well sent to the backboard and there was nary a shadow of a doubt that jail oh wow lol was going to tap that one home beautiful goal for the gators to get the lead that's a really nice play really nice play and you arc have looked a lot better than in game number one however you can look better and still find yourself behind the times they gotta find one more to equalize oh and what a great chance that was Hits the floor, bounces back up, away it goes, and Jaywell with a bit of pinchy help gets this one to the midfield line, goes for the shot as well, and that's going to be saved away. Tough read to make for Arkansas to get the shot off, but you've got to understand that the Gators probably don't have their eyes on somebody following up to take that opportunity. Meanwhile, this cross that opportunity saved away. Double commit necessary from the Arkansas crew. They've got about 50 seconds to get things going. They want to hold on to possession as long as possible. This could be the start of something great, but too strong here against Jerry Quacker. Going to be a tough ball to extricate out of your own zone once again to Pluto taking to the stars. JWoww spikes it up, but it's still going to go on that westward trajectory. Beast and Quacker getting tangled up. That's going to go wide. 30 seconds left. A bit of boost in the tank here for Jerry Quacker to work with. Mess in the midfield line immediately by JWoww. Got plenty of boost to use as well. Looking for the finesse touch. Looking for the drop down. Looking for the bump, but it doesn't matter because already tripping over themselves was the last defender and then it's Orange Blood who draws. And Joe, wow, LOL, establishing early on that the efficiency of a shot like that is present automatically makes every Arkansas player, no matter who's defending that sequence, respect the space. And that's exactly what Joe Wow wants. Give too much respect, too much space. Allow yourself to be open for that bump play. And Orange Blood comes through for the tap home. That ball, though, was already headed towards the target. Don't be mistaken. And Joe Wow wants to put one more home, but the work has already been done. The Gators have already gotten their second win, and a triple match point awaits them here in the series. Rockadilly Dally. That's what I would say the UARC defense was at times. There was too much hesitation. There was too much passiveness, especially when they had the lead of the game. you got to take Rocket League by the scruff of the neck and get something more out of it. Otherwise, you open yourself up to a scenario like this, Galgan. 1-0 up. They end the game 3-1 down. And I've got to give great credit, actually, 
where credit is due to the Gators, because I think their defense actually overall improved hugely. Those errant touches away, they lost possession quite cheaply. All of a sudden, it turned into great communication and rescuing those situations from giving Arkansas more opportunities than perhaps they would have had otherwise. And we always want to look to a specific player. I like the call out defensively for the Gators to get things done, but for, in my mind at least, for this particular game, Joe Wow LOL, player to watch for the Gators, I think that's the easiest call you could possibly make. On the other side, though, for Midnight Black of Arkansas, I struggled to put the onus on one particular player, but I did like what I saw from the Beast early on in game number two. I thought that there was a, a difference in the, the step up of pace that we mentioned that Arkansas need, and the Beast seemed to be leading that charge. So I'm curious, most curious here in game three to watch if that continues to develop, because if this team cannot get together as a unit of three and overwhelm the Gators in that more traditionalist sense, maybe the spark they need is one complete pop off performance here to get them back in if you've got your cliche bingo cards out then here's one for you guys your your team is as good as your weakest member mm. and it doesn't matter so much unless it's an exceptional scenario and you've got an exceptional player i mean i mean galgan that's a goal mm -hmm. and yet it's not case yep. in point yeah and you want to know who was on the end of that pass setting please it up do. so perfectly please do tell the me. beast oh what a surprise who else Oh, and look at this. Entropy just happy to get in the way. Nuisance maker. Oh, there's the beast again. Downtown Route 1 Rocket League. It works. That's another go-ahead goal. Intuition feeling pretty good right now, but that is a nice pass forward. And I, again, return to this point where these are emergence players that are passing better than some challengers I've seen in the NECC. And that is saying something because these teams have that awareness for each other. It's all about the consistency as it is with every player lower than the cream of the crop here in Rocket League. Finding the touches more often than missing them is... More often than not, the key to winning a series in divisions like these. Of course, it's eight weeks of regular season action for each split in the NECC. So to have already, quote unquote, lost three series is not a good look for UARC Midnight. And as things stand, they continue on their way to losing a fourth. Not all over yet, but this is an equalizer they desperately didn't need. And the theme stays true, right? It's the Gators able to claw their way back into the game. It's still very early on this time around. No real sense of dilly-dallying as we've used a lot this series for the Gators to bring themselves back into contention, and you wouldn't expect them to with the pace they've been playing at. But here's another forward pass picked off, however, from Entropy, sent back as Jerry Quacker sends a lob in. It's to the crossbar. Follow-up shot nice has shot. to be accurate, and sure enough, it is. Yeah, he didn't duck out of that one it was a beautiful swan lake of a scene where it was just set up so perfectly for him beautiful shot and jerry quacker assisted the first goal remember scoring the second getting a lot more involved now if we can bring i am zoom in up to the pace if he's able to live up to his name a little bit more then we've got ourselves a real challenge for the gators of course as things stand you are still with the lead Clearly, though, that's what we're lining up for. We're lining up for a zoom-in overtime game winner here that sparks the hope for the reverse sweep, although the Gators aren't really too keen on it. It's a beautiful pass. Shot doesn't connect. They'll be wondering what could have been to, again, very quickly equalize off of dropping a one-goal differential, but now it climbs to two. The Beast gets back in it. With one player on the pace, they weren't doing as great as now you can just see the difference that that extra player who's on the same wavelength makes to an opposition defense pulling them out further making them forcing them into mistakes that otherwise they wouldn't make this a real gut punch to have entropy score off the kickoff we can break this down a little further because ultimately jerry quacker goes in at a good angle but just waiting a little bit is that half a second delay that wins entropy and that's why the follow-up challenge is so important there was no follow-up there was no challenge of course again i have to refrain from saying it's all over for you are because they still have the lead but shipping goals at an increased rate and it's tough too because as far as basic kickoff strategy goes uh -oh. jerry quacker oh this lob uh -oh. is surely going in there's there's no way anybody's getting back to that goal and all of a sudden we are even we are three minutes out from the conclusion three goals for either team oh jerry quacker 
Oh, Jerry Quacker, indeed. That was uh, made a bit of a mallet of that, unfortunately. That was a challenge which he did not need to go into. But sometimes you can see the spark in someone's eyes, an opportunity to win a 50 and guarantee a goal for yourself. Here's a nice chip over everyone, right to the back of the net. I am zooming, no competition. We are going back and forth at a terrific pace for this particular series. Something that I think is worth bringing up though, however, uh, with kickoffs, since we've been talking so much about them and since we've been getting goals so close to them, is as we've got more time to play and hopefully more goals to see, Jerry Quacker will be put back into the kickoff taking position at least oh. twice if we continue on this path. It's something that the Gators could potentially look forward to if they can capitalize on it again. They may not need to do so to equalize as they've gone one, two, Two, three, the third shot though, it's wide and high away from that top corner, and the Gators continue to circle their prey to no avail. Bit of a bit of an unintended doink into the far corner there. That's actually gonna work to the Midnight's uh, particular skill set as they're able to reset themselves and get some more boost in the wagons. Gators given possession. JWL moves out of the way, a good challenge from IM Zoom in. Once again, starting from the back. Here is that blue wall, but no, it's not Carmine Court. JWAV finally finds a way through. Jerry Kaka through the corner and helped on its way. It gets a little touch from Entropy, but here it is. The forward momentum once again. This is a huge pre-weed from Jerry Quacker. And look at that, the near post shot ricochets off the post. Unfortunate, less than two minutes left. Nearly three on one, and yet the goal is not there. The Gators surely want to capitalize on the scramble back into the defensive zone, but they can't do it either. They still don't have the accuracy that they're searching for to level this one at four. Now sent wide. Is anybody there to receive it? It's a one on two. Jerry Quacker should not win that and oh, does not dear. win that, and everybody else buys so heavily in that the back line is wide open. On the stroke of 90 seconds, the Beast just suck it into a situation which he did not need to go towards how many chipped goals have we seen in this game alone you've got to be cognizant of how the game is flowing you've got to read the room so to speak and reading the room you would have seen that that's exactly the sort of goal that everyone's going for because it is a little bit more chaotic it is a little bit more theorious a little bit more hypothetical but there might be a hypothetical fifth goal on the way no that's going to be well marshaled here by Jerry Quacker nice touch here from Pluto bumped out the way falls to no one in particular and with 60 seconds left on the clock it could be anybody's guess how this one's going to go Jerry is speeding up a lot right now. The one to take the kickoff and start the pressure there for UARC Midnight Black at the beginning of the sequence and get the save away and push them all down the side wall, doing it all, but having to save another one. No, it carries just wide as the Gators begin to circle. Once again, always looking ever threatening here when it comes to control. This one's sent close to frame. Have to deal with it in a timely manner. Time ticking down. Another challenge at the top of the zone. Joe Wow tries to hit someone down line but everybody's stuck on the side while now Joe Wow tries to take advantage it's at the top of the box no shot through big preemptive save from Beast and we are barreling towards the finish of game three yeah Beast has got the mop out cleaning up a lot of defensive errors here Jerry Quacker no boost buying good time nice challenge here's the Beast in the shadow position gives it up pretty cheaply the Beast somehow manages to work that quite nicely. I don't know why Jerry Quacker didn't go for it through the wall. Ends up winning the race anyway. The Beast losing out on this occasion. I am zooming. Takes to the other wall. One last chance if you walk midnight. Uh, he loses oh. control immediately. Not enough of the mechanical ability to make the most out of that opportunity. Overtime here in game number three. Either series end or the beginning of a reverse sweep. Would have been quite poetic for Zoomin to get the goal there, but I did call a Zoomin overtime winner, so I expect nothing less from UARC Midnight here. And who else other than Zoomin to be relevant on this opportunity, but not as the shot taker, rather as the passer. Jerry Quacker gives up a ball here, East in an awkward spot. It's a decent first touch, but it does lend itself to the Gators somewhat here to bring that line of aggression farther forward. But here goes Jerry Quacker trying to get to the middle of the field. Joe Wow with a quick challenge, and the Gators again attempt to lock down. That midfield line not allow UARC Midnight any sense of reprieve, any little exit from their zone, but here they come. So much panic from that Arkansas defense. Selling teammates a little bit short, asking too much of each other, or maybe not asking anything at all. It does feel like a team that's playing purely on instinct rather than a team that's communicating with each other. Still, through the 1v1 challenges, they are finding some joy, though. That said, it's on target. Ooh. 
palmed up by Jerry Quacker. Essential interception right back into the danger area. Both players miss. Jerry Quacker takes responsibility underneath one. JWoww's not going to win either. But here they go. Again, another stride forward met with a plum. That defense, it's stumbling over each other, Galgan, but it is doing the job, crucially. And all players have had a bit more space than they potentially need, but it leaves that room for error on both sides of the ball. Now I am zooming, sends a pinch on, and it tests a centering pass. Now from Mission to Pluto, right into the hands of everybody from UARC Midnight, who feel that they all need to give that ball a little bit of their own energy just to get it over. Jerry Quacker has a difficult jump to make here. It's moving quickly against. Now to the sidewall. Entropy with a solid read. The pass goes center. No hands are waiting, but UARC Midnight are slow to respond as well so zoom in plays this one into a concession and the gators get a chance to push back here off of a, another scrappy play How, it, it, it's almost like they're playing the fool right now you are midnight black in in managing oh dear this is an open net oh but that said it's gone a bit too far wide i'll continue with my point it feels in making the mistakes oh in making the mistakes, it was almost unreadable as a situation for the Gators, but finally the mistakes catch up with them. Entropy, nice bounce back into the middle, ready to receive it. It's Joe Wow Lol. Ends the game, ends the series. Uh, and quite frankly, on reflection of things, it was just a quality diff. We can talk about the pace, we can talk about how much we saw improvements from Arkansas. Their goal output much improving, Galgan over the three games however there were far too many errors far too many errant touches far too many triple and double commits that was all going to add up at one stage or another i'm right there with you because as much as you watch that game three and you want the cinderella story to continue on even if it was in its very early stages i know it's great for the content but as we get further into that overtime for game number three i don't know if it feels correct for the gators to drop that one and go to game four they certainly had advantages as you said in very many of the fields of play here in this particular match and while it was great to see the comeback spark here for you arc Midnight Black. They got plenty of close kickoffs to kickoffs and whatnot. Could not get it over the line when it matters most. And Joe Wow LOL to finish it off. Feels very fitting as well. A player who really stepped up for the rest of the Gators squad. Not that any of them had weak performances in this particular series, but Joe Wow LOL was on a tear this particular game. It's a dichotomy that I can only really associate with solo queue playing in any game. Doesn't really matter. They did enough to win that game, Galgan, but they also did enough to lose it. And on this occasion, lose they did. It's a second 3-0 sweep. It's technically a fourth 3-0 sweep if we include those forfeits, of course. I was mentioning earlier, eight games in a regular season. They're now 0-4. and four. Chances of promotion not looking good for them, for their friends over on the Gators. Looking better and better as the weeks roll by. But there's plenty more games to roll on through this particular broadcast. We're going to be heading into our fourth series of the day. Uh, and we're going up to the Challengers. We're going up to the Heartland, where the Universities of Missouri and Northern Iowa go up against each other. It's coming up after this.
Oh, surprise, we got gotcha. you. You thought there was going to be another two minutes 30 waiting. No! We're back. And hopefully my mic is ready to present us. Uh, Relic and Galgan, by the way. We've got ourselves a Challengers Heartland matchup coming. Uh, Mizu Club A. We actually previously mentioned Mizu Club B, who took down Arkansas. It's their A team now. They're going up against... Is, uh, they are regulars at this point on NECC. Uni Panther Esports Purple from Northern Iowa. A 2-1 record up against a 1-2 record, Galgan. Could be an exciting series on our hands here. It certainly could. I mean, lest we forget the Uni Panther Esports Purple squad that I believe we saw last week, if my memory well, serves indeed. me correctly. We saw both of them. We saw yes. both colors. <laughs> saw, saw both colors. This, this particular one playing against Redbird Black JV2 in week number three. And while they couldn't get it over the line there, they did back in week one, hence their one win. Anyway, the past is in the past. Both of these teams are ready and squared up against each other. And this Mizzou Club A roster, I am excited to see them, but we should also keep it straight that Mizzou is a school with very many rosters, always in the conversation of CRL. This club team, while it may be their premier club roster of Silver, Crooked Fox, and TG, I believe is how, or T-A-J, we'll go with however the pronunciation should be read. Regardless, some young guns here for Mizzou Club A. Most certainly. Uh, it's not so much a secret club, but rather a well-known secret in of itself. Let's have a look at the Uni Panther Esports Purple roster, and let's get re reacquainted with these folks. Of course, we've got ourselves, we've got ourselves Koei, we've got ourselves Coin, uh, AJ Witt, though, uh, certainly the standout player for me. He is a captain and a coach through and through. He is someone who has certainly exuded the most calm. Uh, and has certainly got a lot of great mechanics behind him as well. If we expect any good to come from this Panthers roster, it will be through him. But at the same time, Galgan, knowing thy enemy is one of the most crucial elements of any matchup. And if Mizu Club A have done their homework, they'll be knowing who they should try and close down in game number one at the very least. And that's a great thing to call out and look out for. I agree with you. AJ is definitely the player to watch here. Curious to see if Mizu Club A have a similar stature about their roster or if we're going to see that fabled full team effort because we love this 3v3 video game where everybody has a hand in the pot and a hand in the action to score some goals here. Game one underway. Challengers Heartland Division best of five between Mizu Club Club A in the blue, and the Uni Panther Esports Purple taking to the gold. 
course, you'd understand why AJ would be the leader as well when Cole and Colin are twin brothers. Of course, they're going to be up in their grills about anything and everything that they do wrong or right. Uh, but that was certainly a decent opening effort here from the Uni Panther Purple team uh, over in the yellow, whilst Mizu Club A over in the blue. Don't get things confused again. Once again, I realize if it's purple, it should be in blue, but I'm not the one who decides these things. And to be fair, there was a decent shot opportunity there. It doesn't fall on the ball correctly. Moving forward, maybe a chance here for Mizu Club A. Well swept up by the Uni Panther defense. We get used to this first minute, however, being somewhat neutral. However, the last time we said that, it very much changed its course right around this mark. Panthers, though, not quite on the ball the way they want to, so we will get past that first 60 seconds score-free as long as TG can handle this one on the back line, or TJ, I'm assuming. Still a little hung up on that one, but regardless, the effort seen on both sides, opportunities for either club, but none being scored just yet. He wants to go by Teji as well. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it, as long as you get the shots away. And that absolutely the most threatening look from the Uni Panther Purple squad. Because that ball's not going to reach the halfway line for too much longer. This Uni Panther midfield presence is certainly strong. Colin picks up that 100 boost. Frosty and Cole tripping up over each other. A breakaway opportunity is shut down once again. Lots of demos incoming. AJ Whip round the corner. Lovely bit of play. And that's just going to roll into the back of the net. I thought they were something at the near post. Turns out we're all blind to the fact. Cole with the opener. Not sure what happened here either with the defenders. Just a little too far away. Thought closer, but not to be. And almost sort of faking a pass in a sense, but obviously not needing to. Frosty was distant enough in the corner. So it's a good first goal for the Panthers off of some very confusing plays. Everybody looking for their spot on the field. Mizu Club, however, nearly responding in time with a close equalizer. Not to be say this series will be close neither of these squads has come away from a series with a clean sheet and actually Mizu Club A with the better record thus far the only team when they have lost to be swept off the pitch and so that offense really the make or break for Mizu Club A and they're yet to get it clicking as it stands lovely pinch from Colin and that's gonna set up AJ beautifully from the middle of the pitch, straight to be sent into the letterbox. If AJ's got passes like this to finish up on, then the goal tally will surely continue to climb for the Panthers. That is a beautiful touch to find. Had the midfield boost on the turn, AJ as well, under the pressure of another player who was essentially trying to box him out, which is a strategy, again, that we said Mizu Club A could resort to, trying to slow down AJ, but it's a taller task than any, easier said than done. The Panthers will certainly rely on that outlet to keep this offense cooking. Stamped. And already a flaw with Mizu Club A exposed time and again. They look very weak. They look very brittle on the wings. But from the wings, that's a great shot off the, off the crossbar. Out and away. Back into the center. But that goes so far wide, it might as well be going into a different postcode. It's Colin. And enough from the double commit of Mizu Club A to send it into the corner. And a nice challenge there. Able to send to the midfield line. Not for long. It's Cole. Frosty out to the midfield line there again. It's take two. Mulligan, oh, sneaks his way around Colin, and into the center, but where's the shot opportunity? Cole with the free clearance. That's the thing for Mizu Club A, they didn't find it there, but on earlier opportunities, their first attempt on target didn't necessarily look too shabby. It's what comes through in the follow-up attempt, and that same presence on the last opportunity is what Mizu need more of, but the Panthers not too keen to let them get that established. Teji has a catch opportunity blocked away, too strong in the corner, needing to get something going as the time continues to tick, but once again, a good shot comes on here, and a difficult ball for the Panthers to clear, but they still see it away and convincingly at that it's gone all the way to the target on the other side the defense does not react well enough and AJ gets a third it's not so much chance creation that Mizu Club A are, are struggling with here unfortunately there for Teji drops a little too early runs out of boost a little too soon and thus that's a free shot at net rather for me it's the quality of chances that Mizu Club A are fashioning which is the problem and I say quality is the lack thereof all of their shots coming from well outside the box whereas with uni panther they're always working in duos there's always someone ready to shoot off a layoff or off a pinch opportunity as we saw earlier uni panther purple you can tell that this team is synergized you can tell that they're talking you can tell the two of them are twins most certainly and mizu club a have got a 
Think outside the box, really, if they want to get any goal on the board. Follow-ups, so crucial for these sides. And that's something as well that the Panthers, despite their 1-2 and two record, they have that twin synergy, as we have so often alluded to. And AJ is there, uh, rather, not so much in support, but just there to create chaos as that solo agent able to send anything through. It's a good system they have, and when it's on, it clearly shows itself. They've got 20 seconds to close this game out. For all intents and purposes, it looks like they have done just that. The pass is not connecting downfield for Mizu Club. A one last shot on from Frosty, saved away, and looks as though there's no pressure at all on Colin there in the near corner. AJ will get a piece two connected downfield, and that's it. Panthers walk away, likely to be a clean sheet. Hits the back wall one last time for good measure, and that's quite a convincing way to take game one. We do love our case studies here on the NECC. That final shot for me, just further rubbing in exactly how poor Mizu Club A have been in front of net. It's a 1v1. You've got the positional advantage. You've got the opportunity to shoot it anywhere. And they shoot it straight at the keeper. Now, look, their shot count is not bad, Mizu Club A. But how many times were Uni Panther Purple just able to disarm their efforts and then going right down the other side of the pitch they managed to put their chances away pretty easily all things considered i'd say it was maybe one or two individual mistakes that sees that scoreline perhaps a little exaggerated uh, but that is an exaggeration on the part of we should have seen more goals from mizu club a based on the amount of shots that they ended up having on target that's the thing in my head is like, even if Mizu Club A are able to score a couple and make that a closer contest, I feel like the Panthers in response step it up themselves because nothing to me really indicated that they were going to let that momentum go. And we talk again at length about how they weren't able to finish the meal set out in front of them for Mizu Club A. They get the first shot on. They don't have any follow-up. Part of the reason that they lack that follow-up is the fact that the Uni Panthers are being so forward thinking on defense that they take the ball away before a follow-up is even visible and for that Mizu Club A just needs to continue to get more proactive about the play which once again easier said than done but would be a great sight to see. Well, listen to game number two we go and as always we've got ourselves a clean sheet we've got ourselves another five minutes on the clock and early doors Mizu Club A looking a little bit better more shots raining towards our net but that one a little bit too spiked down straight on net from the Uni Panther Purple squad a demo and a free net to shoot at mm -hmm. and Colin you were talking about the meal early he's gonna gobble this one up and it's easy to do it when nobody else is relevant in that follow-up. Like, here you have Frosty jumping from very far away and against the run of the ball heading towards your net. Other defender as well in the corner. Nobody's really close. And Mizu Club A have continuously put their lead defender in such a precarious position that the UNI Panthers have no choice but to score the goal because the look just is that free to them, that open. They have to take the advantage when it presents itself. You know, going back to your earlier point, get your cliche bingo cards out, by the way, again, everyone. <laughs> Goals change games. And mm -hmm. as much as you can say, well, surely if, if Mizu Club had scored, then the, the Panthers would have upped their game. You don't know that because you don't know how teams are going to react to any certain situation. Mizu Club are capitulating. That's the only thing which I see on my screen at the moment. Yeah, I... I don't know. I, I like the point that it's it's going too far into hypotheticals, but nothing that the UNI Panthers have shown me thus far is indicating that this is a fluke, what they had in Game 1. This is a continuation of the complete shutout of Mizu Club A, and it comes from offensive domination. It's a bit more subtle. You don't necessarily see it as evidently as we did in the previous series, where midfield control was just completely locked down. This time around, however, the UNI Panthers once they grab the ball, they know where they're headed, they know what passes they need to pull out, and ultimately Mizu Club A are left playing keep up rather than keep away. That was, I mean, I'd, I'd have labeled myself a psychic if I was in Silver's position trying to read that particular play unfold, and I, I, I mentioned Silver perhaps for the first time today, and that, if anything, says how, gosh, am I really going to use this word? How boring Mizu Club have been very easy to pick up and play very easy to read how things are going to go and even that a real good opportunity by their standards 
is well saved by this Panthers defense that once again gets their clearances perfectly executed right down into the enemy territory. Once again, they're moving with haste into that final third to keep the pressure on, to stop them from doing anything, to dance around their defense, but not to apply the finish on this occasion. It's just so fundamental for the Panthers right now because the fact that they are able to get a clear like that from a position where all three are stacked up outside of the near post is not something that Mizu Club A should be allowing to happen. And they're certainly not very happy with that reality. But there's very little that has been done to change that fact as, again, Colin is the lone defender in front of the near post and still has the Ooh. pace to keep up with the challenge, although that's a nice center pinch. Unfortunate that nobody's there on the goal line to gobble that one up back the other way though the panthers unfortunately missing the target for them mizu club a breathing a slight sigh of relief potentially but they still need to show it on the other side frosty trying to jump start once again though it's, it's like they're trying to put all of their all of their points into long shots what would do wonders for this team is to get some demos off Disrupt that defense, even if you don't get the demo, even if you just get a bump, even if you force the opponent to move out of the way because they're fearful of being bumped. That would be a heck of a lot better than what we're seeing right now, which is the Panthers attack. They either score or they don't. They move back into defense and they save whatever Mizu Club has to throw at them. It just... Get to the ball so quickly. Like, Mizu Club A, you can tell they want these clean touches to come through. The long shots are prevalent as well, but they, they want to be very straight-laced about this game, and the Panthers are anything but on the defensive front. They get in your face when you're not expecting it and don't allow you to set up shop the way you like. Mizu Club A are learning that lesson the hard way, and they're running out of time to adapt and overcome the trials and tribulations that the Panthers set in front of them. They've got nine full minutes without scoring. They've got one minute left to try and find at least one. Two would be excellent. That would at least take them to overtime. The way things have been going, would be a fool to perhaps bet on it. AJ Witt, plenty of bets on himself, and you'd bet on him to do well with this opportunity. It's 3-0, and the, and the ship continues to sink, Galgan. It again feels like the lesson is never learned right now. It feels like Mizu Club A, as that ship is sinking, as you say, do not see the holes in the wood, and rather just assume that everything's alright. A small leak, a little rainstorm ahead must have left this water on the deck, but the issue is growing larger and larger as we continue on. This game, too, as early as it is now, you can write it off as Colin has gone for the hat trick here. Three goals, three shots. Usually, I would be totally understanding of a Hail Mary, throwing the kitchen sink, you're 3-0 down, you got to do something different. Stop the goals going in and figure out what's going on in the midfield. Mizu Club A, that ship is sinking, it is drifting further away from any sort of safety that might befall it. Even this, I mean, Silver with a great chance to get it at least on target. And instead, you can tell how little confidence he has because he goes into that shot sideways. Here's another one. It's the woodwork again. And this is the Panthers taking their foot off the gas, by the way. They don't need to go down and score a fifth goal. They're miles clear. And this clearance goes right into the center of the pitch, right into a dangerous area, forces Silver into a late dive. That's another close opportunity. Once again, off the woodwork. That is, what now, eight unanswered goals? the Panthers but, it's crazy but again how many close opportunities is it going to take for Mizu Club A to change something up because I, I cast my mind back to that last opportunity that Silver had in the closing moments and the fact that it wasn't a shot on target yes it was sad but I'm curious about the comms in a situation like that for Mizu Club A does anybody genuinely think that they're going to be relevant again for that pass because I believe Teji had already exited the zone I wasn't really sure where Frosty was in the situation either so it didn't look likely that the pass was the right play I'm not not too sure why that was the intention and i think that's the theme for very many moments in this match the intentions are unclear for mizu club a they seem like they have five ideas of something to do with the ball but before they even act on one of them it's been taken away of course this isn't rlcs but if i was mizu club a i would take a bit of a <clears throat> a bit of an e time out here and consider a real life game for a change Let's have a look at golf, shall we? You don't put the ball into the hole, usually, with a driver. 
you put it in with a putter. And I think that there's been too many of these shots from way far outside the box, which the Panthers are going to be able to save. In fact, it would be considered an error on their part if they didn't save it. Get in close, work the ball into the box and have strafing runners. Look for those bumps, look for those demos. I guarantee you, Mizu Club A, you'll find a lot more joy because you are pretty close to scoring. You just gotta find that extra spark of creativity. The question on everyone's minds, not just in this series, but in any game of Rocket League, can Mizu Club A put the ball into the hole? The hole, of course, being the net, rather than shanking it into the same water that the ship has been sinking deeper and deeper into as the series has continued on. Meanwhile, on the other side, the UNI Panthers. Not much reason to change anything that they've got going on right now. Cole and Colin have connected on pass-to-goal sequences. AJ has had his Phil on the goal line being dimed up from the other Panthers. Nothing has seemingly gone wrong just yet, but we all know how Game 3 can do dastardly things to teams who are not waiting, but how is that not a goal follow-up from Teji, and it's not there either. I wish I could claim uh, that this was all the plan. I mean, listen, we'll break mm. down how this was a complete collapse in defense in just a little bit. Substitution, Silver out, Sparks in. But sadly, the only bit of creativity he had there was helping to create a double commit at a crucial juncture where one of them had to get a touch on the ball. Now, if you're going to double commit, Galgan, one of you's got to get a piece on the ball for neither of you to even touch it for it to be a free shot at net. An egregious issue, an egregious error, and possibly another huge bombshell to this Mizu Club A squad who might go home from this series without scoring a goal at all. It just feels like Mizu Club A have multiple kitchen sinks in the same room that they're playing these matches, and yet they felt like throwing one out the window in the first minute Surely. of play, because Surely. why hey. not? But there we go. If two misses from the Panthers come out, you've got to score, and Frosty delivers. And that is another double commit, finally. Frosty with some spatial aware. I'm sure Teji was screaming at him. Screaming at him, Galgan. Turn around. It's a free shot. Please take it. And we've got ourselves a tie game past the nil-nil mark. Thankfully, they don't concede straight off the rip. And hopefully, that's an injection of confidence into their veins. Much needed. How about this for a pinch? On the other side, the UNI Panthers. We'll see how the mental changes for them. I Whoa. don't expect much. That is a nice connection from Cole. Better save from Frosty as well. Another spark to add to the collection here for this Mizu Club A roster as they deal with the tricky situation. Teji relevant for a second touch. AJ doesn't quite have the handles. And here goes Frosty quickly, but lot to be desired from that touch. Too strong in the corner. Sparks will have to come through and alleviate some of this tension on the play for Mizu. But they're starting to look a bit more confident right now and the UNI Panthers a bit more scrambled on the other side. Double commit, they still get a shot away, however. They haven't gone out just yet. And I must say, I like the car of choice from Sparks as well. Of course, the Dominant is probably most well known for more heavy-handed touches, more of, more of a clearance machine nowadays than anything. I know it's fallen out of the meta a little bit, but obviously the plank body type does have its uses and I think that it is helping Mizu Club A here. Frosty back in his home base, picks up the 100 boost, going to try and navigate his way around Colin, spoiler alert, doesn't, is Teji, just trying to bait out Cole, but great patience from the orange team player, and this is a bit of a scuffed touch from Sparks, not using that Dominus to its fullest ability, Frosty had to get a piece of this one, and gets a second bite of the cherry, infield, the Panthers looking for that go-ahead goal, and another, another lovely block from Sparks, actually. Teji offered a shot on target, it's scuffed, it hits the woodwork, and away it goes through the pinch. There's another boost steal, however, and Frosty wants to have a sniff of the offensive zone, but has been doing a lot of time living in this back corner and being pushed into demo territory, but not being taken out of the equation just yet. I am looking for Sparks and Teji, though, to try and connect on something. Meanwhile, it sparks to Frosty. Okay. Teji comes through. One, two, three. Mitsu Club A, first lead of the series. Spaghetti Junction as Frosty hits it off the backboard, gets a second touch, and really confuddles the defense. Teji... Again, the call to come up, really well-timed. Open net, unmissable. And that's a, that is a lead for Mizu Club A. That is huge, 
especially given the time remaining, Galgan, only 70 seconds left, but they've got to make sure that they save this, and the upcoming effort double commit, but hey, guess what? One of them got a bit of the ball, and the clearance is converted. And now 60 seconds remain for Mizu Club A to avoid dropping their second sweep loss of the season. Certainly look well within the right to get it done, but that's a power clear from AJ. And if it isn't in the back of the net, it at least opens up some pressure, you would hope. But all they get is a challenge. Now at the middle of the field, the Panthers resting on their laurels a bit here for being down one goal. Chance and not put away. It's wide. AJ Whip. Bad starting position, and now on the back foot, misses that opportunity, run out of boost. Sparks back into the center, Teji, oh, it's off the crossbar. He's gonna want that one back, here's another shot, and it's Frosty Ice Cool, puts it away. We finally see this happening. The UNI Panthers cannot be allowed to sit on the back line for far too long and scramble their way into the saves. Finally, some decisive shot taking here from Mizu Club A, and what a way it would be to advance them further into the series. First step of the way to the reverse sweep. Still work to be done. This one is a 1-2 connection. Collins in a 1-on-1. -on -one. Cole goes now for the connection, but Frosty, big denial to make, could have won the game right there and then. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, but perhaps the writing was on the wall of said tunnel right from the outset. These two teams don't do series clean sheets, and so it proves to be the case again. Mizu Club stay alive. They're off the ropes. They're ready to counterpunch. And if you talk about expectations into the rest of this series, again, you've got two clean sheets for the UNI Panthers leading in to game number three. The most you expect coming into this, I feel like, is, yes, a closer game, but perhaps it ends in OT for the Panthers. You don't really expect this decisive tone shift, but the Panthers didn't really look as convincing on very many of their opportunities, less the one goal that they were able to score. Sure, the connection look strong down end but Mizu Club A especially Frosty defensively showing up in a big way being a difference maker and that momentum has to be carried on into games four and five yeah I, it's definitely six of one and half a dozen of the other for me I think that that Uni Panther defense wasn't as wasn't as correlated as what we saw from the previous two games but then we got to look over to the other side and say well what did Mizu Club A do right and I think that they found that balance between a high pressure push a gag and press if you will uh, to to put that defense under more pressure in the first place but they didn't leave their goal totally unattended there we saw a great save from from Frosty a diving save one for the cameras you could say but at least they're making the saves and that is a difference from game number one it is a difference from game number two and it does rely solely Galgan on confidence and being able to push up and think okay well it's 1v1 but we're going to win that challenge we're going to stop that shot even though it is on target and it's a great sign for Mizu Club A. The shots have been fast from the Panthers. The saves have to be just as quick. And now, off the drop here for game number four, got a good opportunity to try and hammer home this momentum that they have so built for themselves in the series, seemingly. Sparks is up for the touch. It's a tough one to make. Robbed away, though, however, to the backboard. It's a de facto three on one. Everybody's got their likes at the shot, and Cole, wow. with a little help from his friend, gets the goal. I was like, oh, how very RLCS of you going onto the backboard to make the save. No, instead it's the Angel drop down, and it would have been a block, but it was completely scuffed, and that is not a goal that you wanted to see go in if you are a Mizzo club. And I gotta say, a lot of the defensive heavy work done by Sparks, I think that he really has made a difference to this squad, but he's gonna have to do it in a big way in the final third as well, given that they are 1-0 behind. It's difficult when you have those expectations as a defender, right? Because sometimes your role can get a little shaky in the grand scope of Rocket League, especially when things are a lot more fluid towards the top ranks. And you don't necessarily want to think that you have a set defender who's always going to pull it off. But the one touch that Sparks makes there in the early sequence towards the top wall where it leaks back towards Mizu's own net, that spells disaster. And the sequence follows suit where the Panthers get the goal. It's often 
very easy to look at the one small mistake in the sea of 10 decent touches that leads to the goal. But at the end of the day, I mean, that can very well be the difference maker if it's going to result in more goals for the Panthers. One of my favorite players that fills that role is, is Torment, someone who can play anchor, sure, but has a good bit of playmaking in, in him as well, has a good goal too. We talk about that, you know, that how the meta has evolved and how you really have to be good at everything if you want to be a professional Rocket League player. Well, already Sparks showing that he's got the stuff. He's got the stuff. And actually, you can see just how quick these rotations are as well. Meta communication from Mizu Club A. And as long as it remains at 1-0, they will remain with that chance of at least nicking a goal off Uni Panther, maybe forcing an overtime. How about this for an infield pass? Again, great communication. You can see there, there was the poacher coming in very late, but on this occasion, at least, the Panthers' defense holds. And it is the battle of speed versus speed, it feels like, right now, because the Panthers want to play fast on offense and defense, but that leads to some errant misses, and good on Mizu Club A to take advantage. This is a giveaway in the middle of the field. AJ has time, however, to clear it aside. Oh, it's a two-on-three, but they find the passing play above the demolition. All three Mizu Club players way too close for comfort, and the goal's in their net. Very clean. The only way that this goal could have been avoided from where all of those Mizu Club players started was if Sparks just jumped. Seeing that ball come into the center, you've got to jump and throw it into no man's land. It's not the case. And here's number three. Oh, Teji. Lightning fast. Up he goes. Makes the save. Runs out of boost on his journey into the midfield. Frosty with a near post shot as well, however. Once again, batted away. That's a bit of daylight. Maybe number three, Teji, once again stepping in. And now this is an issue because you've got a player here who looks to be with a bit of a hero's complex, putting on the cape, trying to save his team from every wrongdoing. They've got to keep the faith in themselves, Galgan. Otherwise, it will end in disaster. These are incredibly deceptive looks for Mizu Club A because Frosty's been given the green light multiple times here and the Panthers are ready every single chance to clear the ball right on back. They have a very strong defensive stance. They give each other space in the rotation and everything is looking up for them. So Mizu Club A need a hammer, the strength of which to break through this Panther defense, which has stood its task and looked to have massive resolve here in the stages of game number four we are barreling towards the conclusion of regulation at that under 90 seconds to go already and no brighter the outlook here from mizu club a they're running out of boost as well they're expending so much to try and make the shot oh butterfingers it slips away from the grasp of <laughs> poor mm. frosty and colin puts him to the sword that might be the series galgan it might well be it feels like it has to be for Mizu Club. They get too overzealous. Everybody is thinking in that near corner, I can be the one to take oh. this ball away, what? but Teji can be the one to send it top ins. Upper 90 at that, off of the kickoff. It's a beautiful read from the sidewall, which can be ever so dangerous. That's the first step in the door. Yeah, Cole's going to want that one back. I think if we were to be very critical of him, you got to go 90 degrees up, not 80 degrees up. That is the difference between saving it and ultimately seeing it go in. But Mizu Club A once again bringing it back to that two goal disadvantage. AJ Witt moving forward, looking for the bump. Not going to find one, but how about this? Mm. Low as you like, the lawnmower from Cole. And that three goal lead is once again established. And it's really interesting because this stems from the exact same kickoff we had for the previous goal, just completely reversed. And while the Panthers weren't able to send it on target quite as quickly because Cole didn't have the sidewall read or the, you know, afforded boost to be able to jump for something like that, the fact that they still find the goal means that these two teams, again, playing as even as they can despite the series scoreline being fairly one-sided. Mizu Club A have had their chances. The only question is finishing them because with 40 seconds remaining, not a whole lot of time to bring this one back into contention. Yeah, for the Uni Panthers, there is only one. There's only one policy on the manifesto. Keep the ball away from the blue team. And if they do shoot, and if you do find yourself in possession of it yet again, throw it downfield as far as you can. Burn that time off the clock. And crucially, don't give them an opportunity when it presents itself like this. How Mizu Club A have not managed to convert this is, quite frankly, criminal. And to that effect, 
I believe that they are about to be sent to jail. Losers jail. As Muzu Club A will ultimately find themselves on a 2-2 two and two record. The same as their opponents. Now Uni Panther Purple. They win the series. The Purple Panthers of the University of Northern Iowa. They do win the series. A very literal interpretation of what just happened and what transpired on the pitch. But yeah, again, for Mizu Club A, it feels like a cacophony of missed opportunities for them. They certainly had their looks and it warmed up over the series went on. Make no mistake, the games one and two looking very solid for the UNI Panthers. They kept clean sheets throughout both of them and seemingly did no wrong. But again, Again, those adjustments, it's a best of five, a marathon, not a sprint. And for Mizu Club A, a couple steps away from keeping this one contentious. However, just letting it slip right through their fingers at the most crucial moments in this game. It's what ends up dropping them this series. Tough one to swallow. I was mentioning the, 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 the putters earlier. You got to be like a T if you want to be a Rocket League player and, and enjoy any modicum of success. You can't just have a plan B. You got to have a plan C. Plan D and a plan if all else fails, just go to this. And Mizu Club A, although, I mean, their change of plan really was bringing sparks in and it worked. <laughs> but then the Panthers, of course, managed to read what they were doing and thusly dismantled them, of course, and gain them all for a real shame, I think, for Mizu Club A. But I think this is one of those series, Galgan, where they will take or they'll have a lot of takeaways from it they will have learned a lot and they will have seen exactly what a, a team like uni panthers can do to well undo their game plan in the first place and I think something that lends really well to that learning experience for Mizu Club A is the point you brought up about having a plan C, D, and E. For Mizu Club A, it felt like decision making was the key yeah. point. They need to decide on what plan to go through with as early as possible. That proactive play may net them more wins as the season carries on. We'll have to see exactly if they get it done. For myself and Relic, that's going to be us done for the evening, but the action is not for this stream two more matches on the docket for the night the next matchup will take us to the southern illinois university carbondale their maroon roster will take to the pitch against the university of wisconsin white water gray in the emergence midwest division for myself and relic hope you enjoyed the previous matches and then some two more on the way for this evening don't go anywhere next match after this short break Thank you. 
Oh, what is up? We are back. Got Billy here to guide you through the final two matches of our evening here in week four in ECC Rocket League. Oh, it's been a good night so far. Billy, it's been a good night. Wait, you're on this side. You're on this side. Sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm over now. here. Yeah. What are you doing? And over you're there? over there. What are you, what are you doing over there? I, I'm just here. I, I'm just here. Uh, it, it's been a juggle show here tonight with casters going from stream to stream. I was actually on the B stream earlier uh, in relief of FBI Togo. Now I'm here covering him once again while he covered by stuff. It's been all over the place tonight. But what we do have uh, is some definitely good uh, matchups coming up here. University of Wisconsin Whitewater going up against uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, about five hours from me to my northeast. And uh, well, Midwest reigns supreme here. Uh, the SIU uh, squad coming in here on an 0-3. And, and you know what? They, they've taken two games out of their uh, nine played. So, you know, this is a bit of a learning curve for them coming up in this matchup now for Whitewater. Uh, they're coming off of a week one loss, and they've, they've had two forfeit uh, wins in a row. So this could either be a really good match or it could be, you know, just something out of the gate here that we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> As we're looking at your starting lineup for SIU, uh, the that Fearsome Sage, I believe. Yep, that's Fearsome yep. Sage. Shamini, I love that name. Shamini and No No Mint. <laughs> so some fun names here from SIU. I love it. Uh, I love see, the Let's names. take a look at that Wisconsin roster as well. Take a look at our other starters. Maybe, 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 maybe. There it is. There it is. Uh, all right, who we got going on over here, Billy? Ricky the Sig, uh, Air Hammer, and Stonewall. Uh, two seniors and a freshman here, so maybe some senior uh, leadership will come out here for the uh, Whitewater Gray squad here. Here in our Emergence Midwest division. And we'll see, you know, who's going to be able to come out here on top today. Uh, like I said, Whitewater, University of Wisconsin, Whitewater has had two forfeit wins go in their favor. So uh, they've had lots of time to get their uh, get their act together uh, going off that week one loss and see what they can bring into this matchup here. Now, what I've been seeing so far today is the teams are running a 1-1-1 or a 2-1 split. Uh, and we're going to see if that's going to hold true here or not. We got a game one here. It's the best of five, week four. SIUC looking for that first win of the season. U, uh, University of Wisconsin looking for their first earned win of the season. And right off the kickoff, it's SIU who are moving forward. Aggressive start here for them. Look at that already driving towards the net. Left that back a little open, but they're able to recover from the clear quite quickly. Go in for a second round. Might be able to get a shot off here, but no. Dub is too fast to the ball, looking for one in transition. An awkward bounce in front of the net. Followed up from the outside, but it's going to go a little high. And No-No Mints pushing back out to midfield. Only momentarily, another challenge towards the net. Denied. Well, we're going to see here what uh, Whitewater uh, has defensively. We've seen a couple of good little pushes towards uh, their own offensive third. That was a great ball in front. There it is. James cleaning up the uh, missed couple whiffs there from in front of the net. And I mean... That was a dangerous ball. Going near post. I thought it was going to go in off the first shot, but James there to clean up the trash on the back end. And, yep, calculated. They meant to do that. Of course they did. Of course they did. Uh, and, yeah, we had a little bit of a last-minute change here with, with James coming in. And, and what a decision that was. They're going to open up scoring here for this entire series. Really kind of set the pace. Well, we'll see right now uh, who's going to be able to dominate the midfield. That's something that I've been seeing all day long. Uh, looks like uh, SIUC are going to be running uh, this 2-1 rotation here. There you go. No, no mitts with a nice little duck near post goes against the run of play. Uh, you know, 48 kilometers per hour. That's about 20 miles an hour. And I mean, that's just a nice little tippy tap. Nice little redirect there on the goal. Yeah, where you see just kind of got caught flat footed on that one. Let's like move out of the corner to find that goal. Nice little double tap. The mechanics on it. He fits left door open for him on that near post. You'd have strike back and then immediately into the zone. But there's some Sage able to hold down midfield line. He's going to punch it into the back. There's the follow up on it. Playing it out of the corner. It will at least work out a little bit. But Air Hammer closes that down. Is it stolen? Is a good offensive rotation for Nono Mintz. He's going to stick it right in front of the goal. There's a demo, but the ball goes right back into the corner. Uh, SIUC now coming in for another a shot as they continue the bombardment. This one not on target. Clear much needed here. UW Whitewater have got to get this out soon. They're running out of resources. And there's another good challenge from Fearsome Sage to keep it in. 
Yeah, I mean, we're looking at a really high press here in this 2-1 offense coming from SIUC. They're meeting the ball at the midfield line and getting great uh, 50s there. And I mean, that shot had eyes for the back of the net, but nice save there from Ricky the Sig. And I mean, the rotations here for Whitewater, they're playing a 1-1-1, uh, and they're looking to be able to kind of get the mid rotation through. And I think that's really going to come down uh, to how they rotate uh, when the ball is in their defensive third. They need to be doing stuff like that, weaving and wa uh, waving out through traffic. The much needed clear. And a wide open net for Ricky the Sig. Two player, two defenders just absolutely missing the mark. And you could drive a truck through the hole that was left open there. Nobody home. Ricky DeSig comes invading through the back door. I mean, that's a great assist there coming from Airhammer, though. Uh, being able to get that little touch high off the backboard. I uh, kind of let them a little bit running for air there. And I mean, you get the full joy out of it. Look at that coming from the other side. Yep, that'll be a goal. There's <laughs> some sage, yes. You you will need a follow-up shot on that, but good to be there. Good job. Zishing, not giving up on the play. Standard Seems soccer. Like all offense here so far, Billy. <laughs> Standard soccer. Uh, you always crash the net, just like in hockey, uh, in case there's a rebound or, you know, a, a, pro, a providential touch there. And, I mean, that just sat there for Fearsome Sage. Um, I really like the aerial play that we're starting to see come out from SIUC Maroon here. They, uh, they're not really backing off of these challenges. And Shamini uh, has been playing very nicely in the back uh, in the back line, not afraid to go forward and get their rotations through. And they've done a good job of maintaining control because of it. We're going to lose the line here. 2v1 in front of the net. No one's going to go over the head of the defense. We're going to say it gives University of Wisconsin the lead right back. They weren't the blue half long, but it was long enough for them to strike a deadly blow. Uh, so sometimes it's placement over power, and that was exactly what you saw there from Ricky the Sig, just getting a little flick over the outstretched uh, chassis of the defender. And now back to a 1-0 or a one-goal lead here as we cross over halftime. Five goals in the first three minutes and 50 seconds. And we're just in game one. Contact out of James saying, get out of my house. Of course, the ball is still there. Threatening air hammer. Ooh, I'm not sure... There we go. Okay, that's that's it was almost on target, but you know, at least force an honest check out of the defense, force that rotation. Now you see though, now we're working out of their own zone. Oh, missing the touch on that one. Really wanted it. James is going to come in and push it towards the blue net. It's a race that the defense will win. Working that ball back into the corner and a nice challenge for Fearsome Sage across the midfield. Yep, we're looking uh, at the genesis here of what they're trying to build into this, and I mean the physicality is starting to come out. None of it's. Right now, I want to see them get a little bit more involved here. Fearsome Sage has been all over the pitch as well as uh, Shimini. Whitewater in full defensive mode. Just seeing they can save off all of this movement. All the directions this IUC are trying to threaten from. Worked thus far, but here we go into the air. Comes Fearsome Sage. <laughs> crash down on top of Air Hammer in the corner. All stuck there for now and gonna fall out in Whitewater's favor. A good touch midfield from Ricky the Sig. The shot will end up wide. This is going to bounce back out, but a great move here from UW Whitewater. If they can hold it in this zone for a little bit longer. Oh, no, but they can beat it midfield. Ball head towards the net. Saved easily enough, and here's some Sage. Goes to challenge. Try to give SIUC a chance in these final 40 seconds. Resource management right now for Whitewater, and they've really been winning the, the war of attrition here as far as the boosts are concerned. That's a great little 50 there. Shamibi trying to follow up, doesn't get the joy on it. 30 seconds left here. Fearsome Sage with the ball on the back line. There's a pass. There no, no, Mintz. There's the equalizer. 26 seconds left to go. Brilliant play. You can kind of feel the pressure mounting. And Fearsome Sage just works off the wall, and it drops in a perfect spot. This is exactly what SIUC needed. We're headed into the final 26 seconds with a tie game here in our first game uh, between these two. First game in our best of five series. Game to the touch off kickoff. DNEW Whitewater in the blue half for one of the rare times. They've been good on the time they've had in the blue half thus far in this game. Converting on far fewer shots than what we see at SIUC Maroon here. They're going to try to set up another one going through the air, but it's a little too high. Can't quite get to it. Clear come through. That ball looks like it's going to drop, and we're headed to OT. I mean, golden goal situation right now, and you've got to think that the uh, momentum right now is in the SIUC's favor, getting the last goal there, getting that equalizer with less than 30 seconds to go, but nice little jump ball there. 
James goes up high and kind of whiffs on it there. So we're going to look now to see how do they rotate through this? How do they deal with the pressure? Little uh, challenging ball there. Defense is going to have to really clear that through. Here comes Fearsome Sage with a head full of steam. Sent away. Bit of a demo there, midfield, just trying to slow things down here for the defense at SIUC. Could have been a tight situation, ball in front of the net. That was going to get blocked. No, no, mids, a little bit of collision from their own squad, but they managed to get in front of the ball. Big boom down the other way is going to buy some time for both of our squads. UW Whitewater looking to come oh, in no. with all the resources. Ball in front of the net, but it's pushed out for some stage. On a race down, gets past one, but the ball isn't quite on target. Here comes no, no, mids for the follow-up. That's off the crossbar. Here comes a third in for that touch. Goes up for 90. It's blocked. Fourth one is blocked. The SIUC just ran into an absolute barricade in front of the Whitewater net. I mean, the fourth man also helping out Whitewater there. I mean, you got to thank the, uh, your stars there. That's going to be a shot. What a great predictive jump coming up there from SIUC. They knew that the shot was going to come near post and got up nice and high before they could get in the back of the net. Now the counterattack is on. In out of the corner, demo in front of the net, shot from up high, Whoa! bounces a little too sharp from Fearsome Sage, and the follow up is off the near post. Big clear from Ricky to Sig, and a pressure relief valve hit from UW Whitewater. All still kind of jammed up, going back and forth. Good pass to the center, but UW need to back him out of there. And Whitewater, the defensive rotation, what a challenge! But the bar still spits towards the middle. That touch doesn't go very far. Fearsome Sage will push it towards the net. They do sacrifice themselves for the effort. Here comes University of Wisconsin back on the attack. Yep, we're about we're two minutes in now into the overtime, and we've seen chances for both squads here. The switch play coming from SIUC has really been opening up the field as far as their counterattack and when they're going into their offensive third. I really want to see a little bit more cleanliness on their back shots, and that oh. should go in. Oh, the whiff on the goal line. It had been so clean here in the overtime. Bull skunk. My friend, I mean, look at the touch there. Just the click. Oh, man, that's that's painful. That's a painful goal to see there in overtime. Yeah, you mentioned earlier the importance of accuracy over power, and that was a picturesque display of that because it was just the right amount of finesse on that ball to keep it out of the hands. It was just pixel perfect far enough. So the defense couldn't get to it, and it bounced off the post to come back and end for the overtime game winner. What a start to the series. What a finish for SIUC. I mean, this is going to be a fantastic series. If we keep going in this vein, I, I assume that we're going to have a nice battle here, uh, probably culminating in a map number five as we look at the highlights here from game number one. This is what we've been really looking at. This is the, uh, the tenor of the conversation. And, you know, we always saw the answer come from UW Whitewater, but they just weren't able to capitalize at the end with that third goal, the equalizer with 26 seconds left. That's what took us to overtime. Ricky the Sig had a really strong performance uh, out of the middle uh, for UW Whitewater, uh, playing in the second man role and uh, really had some very nice touches, not only defensively, but also offensively scoring two goals. But in the end, uh, it was uh, the fact that SIUC gets that, you know, follow up, gets a nice little finesse shot that goes in uh, in two minutes, 15 into the overtime, Jeff. And that's what we like to see. And there it is. There is the finale there from Fearsome Sage. That's a fantastic goal. And, uh, well, now we're back into game number two. And, uh, well, we see uh, SIUC back on the attack again. They're already putting pressure on. We're right out of the gate here at game number two. Good aggression from University of Wisconsin here. As they were pressing up more towards the midfield line in the beginning than what we saw in game one. Rotation back here, of course, because here. There's a stage. Working nicely out of the corner. I wanted to get to air hammer. I think a, a little too far past. And offense kind of just resetting here for SIUC, but they get it stolen. No, no, Mintz is able to come through with that save, but a great check from yours, Wisconsin. I mean, that, that, that's like a floor check there in hockey, isn't it? I mean, just meeting him at the midfield line. That's a great little tap there. Uh, rebound shot. Get Swift on. Now it's all about the counterattack here. And that's a nice, safe touch uh, into their defensive third near the Mega. They're going to be looking to see how they could push out from here because now we're seeing Whitewater stack some passes, Jeff. Air Hammer looking for one. Way up high. The Ringing the Six is going to come away with a shot that falls a little bit off target. This one goes up onto the backboard as well. Looks like that was just to punch it towards the net and see what happens. But it goes back 
against Whitewater here as they find themselves in front of their net with quickness. And SIEC are looking to keep it there. Yeah, a punch in deep. They read off the wall here from Wisconsin. They take that momentum and ride it all the way back into the corner where our teams are going to battle it out. Wisconsin trying to get the shot. The flick isn't quite there. James has landed in the defense out of position. Fortunately for them, the shot was off target. I mean, much. I mean, this is starting to really turn into a counterattack situation here for SIUC. They've been looking, you know, to absorb the pressure coming in defensively and then push out uh, with a vengeance. And they've really been sticking to their guns here. Also, the midfield play from both teams has been pretty spectacular. Uh, they're really getting, you know, about a lion's share each of the uh, holes there. And there's the first goal here. Uh, two minutes and five seconds in to our second game. And Ricky the Sig, once again, copying uh, the performance that we saw from game number one. That was a heck of a finish. Right place, right time. Uh, that's a, a hot spot to shoot from as well. Just great positioning from Ricky the Sig. And UW Whitewater, able to start off strong here in game two. They need to bring it back. SIUC up 1-0 in the series. We're gonna clear it down. A 1v3 in the corner. A decent bounce here for SIUC Maroon. And Spartacus with a great aerial 50. He's going to push it in the corner. There's not enough follow-up on it. And UW Whitewater not coming back. Uh, Shimimi is uh, taking a seat here in game number two. Uh, allowing the uh, new player to come in here. And uh, get some time on the ball. And, you know, gets, uh, gets demoed for their first uh, couple touches on the ball. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Flicks it over the defense, gets past the one they needed. James increases the score to two here for University of Wisconsin and Whitewater with a comfortable lead. Well, I mean, we saw a lead uh, evaporate twice, three times actually in the first game. So definitely not over here for University uh, of uh, Southern Illinois. And we'll see uh, what they've got up their sleeve here. We just crossed over halftime, 2-0 lead here for Whitewater and uh, Airhammer. Looking for a little waterfall shot, forces a save. Out of no no. That's from James. Back into the corner with it. Laying off the near post. So you see the defensive rotation holds. If you're some sage can't escape the zone. Finally a big clear comes through. No non no no mints is there to pick it up. We're taking it back around. Second player misses it. Third man comes in, which is the back of that Spartacus. Now looking to just one. Ooh. Yeah, that, that, what a one man show that one was. Spartacus just narrowly missing the mark. Really like the injection of Spartacus here, bringing a different flavor yeah. and nice set there. I mean, that was all predicated on what Spartacus did. 1v3 uh, and then the nice touch uh, off the backboard there and the clinical, not an easy shot, just slips it in underneath the crossbar. And that's a one goal deficit now to uh, SIUC Maroon looking at 86 seconds left here in game number two. Good setup from SIUC. Uh, I mean, Spartacus got the double tap. Great. Didn't quite have it, but Nono Mints is there for the backups at the perfect position to follow up on that <laughs> rebound. Narrow miss here. Speaking of rebounds, James is going to take one. That'll put the lead right back at two. Didn't take long for Wisconsin to respond. Uh, sloppy rotation. That's all that was. They were pushing forward, thinking the touch uh, that initially saved the first goal. Uh, was going to be enough for them to push out. And, I mean, that's part of their game plan is to push forward uh, when they gain possession, but they actually didn't uh, clear and secure the clearance there. So, uh, wonderful there from Whitewater. And now two-goal lead, one minute left on the clock here, Jeff. And, and Whitewater looking a little bit stronger here in game number two. All I need to say, hold on for a little bit longer. Punch out there. It doesn't go all the way. Shot right back at the goal. A little bit of a back and forth between University of Wisconsin. But the ball doesn't go very far. And here comes SIUC on the attack again. No, no, Mance can't get as solid a touch on that as they would have liked. But Spartacus isn't going to get one either. Two opportunities kind of falling by the wayside. Here for SIUC Maroon with only 30 seconds remaining. They really needed one of those to go. They really did. And, I mean, we're looking at, you know, 25 seconds left on the clock. That's going to be... Well, that's going to be a nice little save there. Nice re uh, redirect there from Fierce at a weird angle. 15 seconds. Ball in front of the University of Wisconsin net and a demo. Air Hammer only outside. He's going to punch it up. That just buys a lot of time. This ball drifts back down towards the blue half and closer. 
the University of Wisconsin tying up this series. That'll do it. Ball will fall. Game two will end. Whitewater will take that one three to one, and we're all tied up. You know, it has been, at least for me uh, on broadcast, it has been a day of seesaw battles and we're getting treated the same thing here. Uh, Ricky the Sig uh, has been really impressive for me here. Uh, really being in the right place, right time. And James, you know, the substitute that we didn't know was going to had two goals on the day so far today. And we're looking uh, at how they're being able to bring themselves into uh, more of a prominent position. Spartacus on the other side, though, uh, being the substitute off the bench here for SIUC, uh, really provided a different level uh, of play here, really uh, excelling in the air, uh, winning a lot of aerial 50s, and also setting up a beautiful goal. What a comeback. What a bounce back here from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. I mean, I mean, this it, is a, it can be easy to let the middle fall apart, you know, after the first game doesn't go your way, but they just stay the course and you're able to come through and, and really control the ball a lot better. They did. I mean, and I think that they really won the midfield battle as well. So uh, we're taking care of that. And uh, you know, we're going to hop into game number three now. Uh, you know, it's a, now uh, it's just a basically a first of two now. We'll see who gets uh, two wins on the board. Somebody's going to come up with a win. And that was almost a goal right off the rim. Whitewater dodging a bullet on that one here in the opening 10 seconds. Game that will decide who moves up to match point and have a lot of momentum at their back. Deep clear lands right in Spartacus' lap, who's going to stick around here for game number three. No subs uh, on either side, matter of fact. Ball dropping from Air Hammer, working out of their own corner. They get all the way back down to the other side. Spartacus chasing up now. Doesn't get a solid touch. And Ricky the Sig, their big challenge, forces it the other way. It becomes a scramble on the opposite side. A lot of contact comes through from SIUC Maroon, but Air Hammer is the one with a touch put against the wall. Buys a little bit of space for them to get back and work this midfield line. And it's a, an incredible battle for possession between our two teams right now. I mean, they're battling over resources, they're battling over possession, they're battling over positioning, and I mean, there's a nice drive towards the net, nice demo in front of the net. You're going to be in a 3v2 situation here very shortly, and now we'll see if they can build anything off the back of it. I, I want to see Nono, uh, Nono Menses really push themselves into the forefront in this game. Kind of been quiet since game number one. Ooh. There's some saying able to work some magic in front of the net. It's around two defenders, that one touch there. And this just leaves James a little bit low. Neither player able to get the jump on that ball from the defense of Wisconsin. Here's some Sage dances around and scores a goal. 58 miles an hour off of a uh, basically a half volley off the ground there. I mean, that's not easy to predict. Uh, basically split the defenders there, scoring the goal. Great uh, mechanics there from Fearsome Sage. I want to see what Whitewater's got in the bag here, but that's a great drive. And just a little flick, just a little flicky flick going in the back of the net. Uh, that was a very uh, Luka Doncic type, type move. Got started in the back, super patient, just drives up and a couple smart moves and easily dances their way in. That's a Mavericks reference, isn't it? It would be. I, I love it. I love it. I, it's Luka Doncic, isn't it? Luka yes. Doncic. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. I love it, but you know what I love even more? I, I love the fact that we are seeing, you know, just a ton uh, of impetus coming from SI Take. Uh, you know, they don't really back off from what happened in game number two and are really, really poor here with this last, uh, with this last getting a two goal lead is absolute imperative. Yeah, it's an incredible turnaround. That's, they're going to make it three as No No Mints comes in and slams one in right at the three minute mark. Uh, that's just an unfortunate touch there from James. And I mean, you go far post with it. 101 kph about 55 miles an hour so i mean that's still a lot of mustard on that sauce and you know what as we cross the uh three minute mark here now siuc with a hat trick lead biggest lead of the day for either team yeah a surprising start here in game number three. Oh, oh, oh. oh and fearsome sage will chase out another one that's the hat trick for fearsome sage themselves wow that is uh that's impressive uh, being able to get yourself back off of the carom there uh, from the far post and getting yourself uh, using the boost to get yourself there and get the little nudge in. That's a fantastic finish. Four on the trot here for SIUC, Jeff. And I mean, as we approach halftime, uh, Whitewater got to be reeling a little bit. 
Oh, Fearsome Sage has just stepped up in a huge way in this game. Just a ridiculous performance coming out of them right now. Playing out of their minds to score these three goals and, I mean, really putting on a superstar performance. You know, just like the NBA reference I made before, known for that smart play is why I made that reference. And Fearsome Sage is playing with that kind of style and that kind of superstar ability right now. Ooh. Almost had a fourth. Got denied right at the line. I mean, that's, you know, the, I mean, the, the game sense is starting to show out here, isn't it, Jeff? I mean, we're looking at, uh, you know, Fearsome really coming into their own here in game number four. Uh, and you know what? I mean, I think they're going to be looking at, uh, a, you know, a fantastic finish here. We'll see uh, how this is going to play out. But right now, I mean, they has to be starting to get bodied. You need to get a chassis on them. You need to put them under pressure. Bumps, demos, doesn't matter. Something to break up their rhythm. Aaron's going to come in and break up that play. Just into the ball flying. We'll give you Whitewater one gold, and they need it now. Spartacus! Spartacus. Yeah, <laughs> that was a dangerous move. Spartacus almost had goal number five. No, no, Minson, no threatening into the corner. Ball's going to spin on the middle. Fearsome Sage has the <laughs> shot, has another one. <laughs> That's absolutely dirty. I mean, no, no, Mintz, uh, very strong in the air, gets the 50 challenge. It doesn't necessarily go his way, Jeff. But the Karam off of the pinch there definitely goes into his path of travel and fearsome shade. Now with four on the trot. Yeah, no, no, man. Uh, I think got enough of a duck on that. Send it back the other way. It's a being a perfectly centered ball. You got to get the right angle on the car. If it was just there, it'd be pixel perfect. Flick here towards the net. Doesn't have a whole lot of mustard on it. Works back into the middle. Is going to give him another shot. And James is making sure that UW Whitewater is not going home scoreless. Well, I mean, that is, uh, will start the beginning uh, of what could be a comeback here. And, I mean, at least for the mental, uh, this is good. And, I mean, just going back against the run to play such a smart shot. And uh, you know what? 107 left on the clock here. Time for more goals. Coming out of w University of Wisconsin, Whitewater here. Uh, you know, they, they may be a little bit lacking here uh, as far as being able to tie the game up. But every goal in their favor here is going to do them in good stead for game number four. So you see, just even some pressure on here in this final minute to protect this lead. You know, Whitewater can't score if they can't escape their half. If they can get out of it right now, it's a challenge that No-No Mintz is going to win, and the ball is going to spit back down as Mintz falls back for some resources. Spartacus goes up for an attack. It's pretty heavily to that, as a matter of fact. Ball will eventually spin out towards that direction. It is through the air. Comes Fearsome Sage for goal number five for them in this game alone. Can I just mention how much Spartacus has been a spark here for SIU Carbondale? Uh, we saw uh, Shimini go out in favor of Spartacus. And Spartacus has been the assist leader here in our lobby, in our server, uh, since they have come on here. I mean, just setting up balls, getting providential, so really being in the right place, right time, and setting up the team time and time again. Some 30 seconds now, five goal lead. Uh, this is pretty insurmountable here for University of Whitewater, but I think a goal here, uh, once again, will help with the mental going into game number four. Five goals on eight shots there for Fearsome Sage. Having just a phenomenal statement of a game three to put the fear of God into UW Whitewater. That's <laughs> how you see with a big threatening message. They're going to close out this series at four. I mean, yeah, that could have been a goal too. Uh, if there was even a little bit more time, that probably would have been a goal as well. But I tell you what, SIUC uh, Maroon coming out here and putting their stamp of authority on this game and fearsome sage with a five goal performance here uh has turned this server into their own personal launch pad uh for a bit of stardom and i mean it's not without the play of nono men's and spartacus in the back uh their supporting cast the backup singers if you will uh for the fearsome sage i've seen so far i love it uh, uh encore encore <laughs> I love it. Please, I love please, it. give me, give me that, give me the sweet sounds of more fearsome sage. You know what I really want to see is James and and uh, the Sig really get themselves inserted more into this game. I want to see them going with reckless and bandit into some of these challenges because, for real, uh, some of the touches that have led to goals, but it's a lack of physicality. I think that has been lacking here for UW Whitewater. 
Uh, they really need to step it up and, and send a message uh, here early uh, in the early game. I mean, there, look at that. Just a little tap. Shouldn't be a goal going in. And it is. No, no, that's with the touch from Fearsome Sage takes care of it. Fearsome Sage starting things off strong. And then no, no, man, it's right there for some backup. We get by with a little help from from, from our friends. <laughs> I mean, that that's an old song. I, I need a little help from my friends. Oh my gosh, what the touch? What the I'm an touch? Old soul. What can I say? Uh, so am I. I mean, we're both old. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I, I, I've got a couple of months on you, but. Uh, I tell you what, uh, what's not old is seeing the great play here on this stream right now. And I mean, SIUC Maroon, they are winless on the season, by the way. And they are not playing like it. What a save there from Nodo Mint! The ball was being driven towards the goal and the flip and the flick away. Good challenge here. It's almost set up for goal number two. Air Hammer slowing things down here out of the backfield, working across the line. And a couple of moves to get past. Two, working out of the corner, has a player in the middle. James has got it. UW Whitewater will tie this game up. Oh, beautiful move to push in along the outside and get that ball in the middle, get the demo. Incredible play there from Airhammer. I mean, Airhammer, yeah, sets that up with the demo because that would have been a block shot. Uh, but when the, uh, when, the, when the car isn't there, you can actually shoot through it. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Traffic in front there, and there comes another demo out for Whitewater. So the physicality definitely being ratcheted up here from University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and they've got themselves back in this series. I don't know, man, it's got to hide the defense a little bit. You're going to have some help, but defense of Whitewater is able to rotate around, kind of stabilize a little bit, but they haven't gotten out of the zone just yet. Awkward ball here, picked up by James, going back towards the blue box. Oh. Some Sage comes out for it. Looking for a second touch here. It's not strong enough. Kind of rolls out towards the middle. Where it's UW Whitewater, Air Hammer coming in, looking for the lead. Won't get it. Ball is pushed back towards the net. Back into the corner, both of our teams go. And ball pinches out towards the favor of SIUC. I mean, that was a great rotation there from Nono Mans being able to come back and stop that shot coming in. And then the smart touch, finding their player out in traffic uh, and being able to push forward. Now, James is starting to really insert themselves into this game. They've been getting a lot of physical touches. They've been getting a couple of demos. Ricky DeSig has also been uh, really uh, contributing in that factor as well. And there we go again. Another demo coming up at Spartacus with a nice touch off the side. Oh, beautiful Whoa! move off the side. And that's SIUC with the lead. That is fantastic, Jeff. I mean, look at that. I mean, just goes up there. I mean, there is a whiff there, obviously. But, I mean, the ball was traveling at such a great speed that I don't blame the defender there for not getting a touch on it. But, I mean, just the, the wherewithal to know uh, that you need to drop and get just the barest of touches on the ball. I mean, this is going to be goal-bound once again. We're going to say it has to come back in rotation. And we talked about the the statement, the, the importance of Spartacus coming in. And, and how that was felt and, and really made such a difference in this series. And there we go. The go ahead goal in game number four. Beautifully done. Back in front of the net. UW Whitewater wanted to tie this up. Spartacus <laughs> able to get the save. They're second of this game. Now pushing out, trying to get out of the zone. It's Ricky the Sig keeps it in for Whitewater. Shot here. He's going to go back to Ricky the Sig. That one's going to go off the crossbar. The follow up from James, not quite there. James with a little flick to put it back on net. With the defense all over it. Well, Air Hammer's not going to be giving up on this play. Am I looking for the double tap? No joy there. And James is there looking for a little bit of a touch in the corner. They do get the corner boost, but now they're going to have to rotate back very quickly. Spartacus with the setup again. Oh, my word. Had no, no in their sights. Just a little bit under them. And that's not, I mean, that's not a bad play there at all, Jeff. That was very close to being goal number three. The time for Whitewater to get back into this. The possession here will go a long way. That challenge is a decent start, but we'll lose the second. Drops back out. Rotation from Ricky to Sig. Keeps it into the blue half. James not able to get up high enough to it. Ball's going to fall behind the defense. Here's some Sage's touch goes off to the side. That could have been a dangerous ball there for Whitewater, but they're able to survive for now. Spartacus chasing one down across the front of the orange net. Gets demoed as it approaches the wall. Push back down. UW Whitewater have recovered. No, no, Mitz doesn't think so. 
They're going to force that one into the zone and still more time. All going in SIUC's favor. Will this goal? Spartacus. Yes, it will. Spartacus got demoed, Jeff. I uh, came back into play, obviously with 33 boosts when you start out with. Got back there, got the touch on the ball, centering pass directly to Noto Mintz. That is beautiful. That is a super sub coming off the bench for SIUC. One minute to go, two goal lead. I was saying, just squeeze it and just jumped in around all three defenders to get that ball, spit it out right towards the middle. What an effort coming out of Spartacus. Incredible centering pass and what could be the game winning goal. I mean, that's impressive. Uh, I don't care what you're saying. But no, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's an old, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a wonky touch there. I mean, if you look at, at the shot coming in here, they're going to try and spin themselves around to get to it. And there's just an unfortunate touch there. That was still had eyes for the back of the net, but just a little bit of extra help going in there from UW Whitewater and a hat trick lead with 43 seconds, about 14 seconds of goal here. It's not completely out of the realm of possibilities, but we just need to see Whitewater ratchet up the pressure and stop this possession game that SIUC have been really laying on thick here in game number four. I don't know. This one is looking pretty done and dusted to me, Billy. SIUC have an firm command here for the past 10 minutes, nine and a half, if we're being technical. Okay. I don't see Whitewater wrestling it back here in the end of game four. SIUC Maroon have had this on lock, and they will find their first win of the season after a rough first three weeks, after a rough start. SIUC Maroon will come out on top, not without giving up one here at the end. Whitewater, if you make a four-second comeback with two goals, then I will be happy to eat my words. Uh, same. But, I mean, you know, that's bomb for the soul right now uh, because, I mean, you'd have to get, you know, just the kickoff win. Uh, it'd have to be a, a Swiss style. Two kickoff goals, essentially. Yeah, I mean, that's it right there. Uh, that's basically it, and that'll do it. So that will be the first win of the season here for Southern Illinois University Carbondale. The Maroon team coming through uh, with flying colors. And I tell you what, uh, this was fantastic out of them. They really... Uh, felt their oats tonight. And I tell you what, Nono Mets uh, really showed up in game number four, Jeff. But I mean, the, the talk of the day for me huh? is Spartacus coming off the bench, uh, getting saves, getting, you know, assists, uh, scoring themselves. Just a fantastic performance out of this person off the bench. Yeah. Uh, the, the, really, everybody kind of had their game. Uh, Fearless Sage, or Fearsome Sage, excuse me, with seven goals on the day. Uh, no, no, Mints also had seven goals tied for our server leaders there. So I definitely don't want to take anything away from those two, but I can't help but feel that it's, you know, Spartacus definitely came through and, and gave him a new look and kind of helped those two to really like fulfill their potential, particularly in games three and four. Yep. I mean, and I, my dog is trying to eat my arm right now, but uh, yeah, I this mean, it was a fantastic, <laughs> it was a fantastic contest here. And I mean, looking at, you know, what they got coming up next. I mean, this, the end of the road uh, is not too far in sight and, you know, getting themselves on the leaderboard now with the win, this might spark the beginning of a huge thrust here coming from SIUC and for Whitewater. I mean, they've got to go back to the drawing board now, my friend. Well, let's get thrust us forward uh, to the last match of our evening. We're going to take a quick little intermission. When we come back, it's Fresno State Red taking on the Westcliff Warriors when we turn to our final game of week four. See you in a minute.
<laughs> we Hi. are back. We are here. I uh, appreciate your patience for the extended break, friends. But it is time for our final match of the evening here between Fresno State and West Cliff Warriors. Uh, Chef and Billy back at you. Wait, I still go to the side. This is not you're over there. It feels so weird because my monitor. I know. Here, and I'm used to actually looking at your face, and then I'm, I'm at least facing the right direction. I can either I'm staring at a wall, and people like you know I'm folding the camera, uh, but then I can't actually see you. This is it's okay. Anyway, moving on. Fresno State, West Cliff Warriors. Well, of the I six mean, games these two teams have played, only two of which have been recorded. Report your scores, people. Come on, report your scores. Come on. I mean, report they've got a bye. Uh, West Cliff Warriors uh, ha have a bye in the first okay, week. Okay, so it was five games. Though. Right. So five games. But out of those, uh, well, we just don't know. Um, we've got a, a no and two record with a no report here for Fresno State. Uh, they have won two games out of their six games that we know have been played. Uh, so, you know what? We had this situation in our last series, Jeff, uh, where we had a team that, you know, maybe not looking so good on paper, but we have a no report. And we have people that are ready to come out here and play and put their hearts on the line here. And we saw that happen in our last series. So, you know what? Fresno State, West Cliff Warriors. Uh, well, we don't know what kind of a sample set we're going to get out of West Cliff Warriors, but they're here. And now we're going to be able to settle the score once and for all. Well, I want to talk about these players from Fresno State because I know Rebirth has a pet turtle, and I just think that's the most, like, wholesome thing ever. I want to know the name of this pet turtle. I would like pics of this pet turtle. I want to see... Uh, I'm guessing it's named Raphael, because that's what I would name a pet turtle. I would name mine Michelangelo, because Michelangelo was the best Ninja Turtle. Um, uh, but we'll we'll go with that. Uh, that's my statement for the day. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, uh, also typing, apparently, is a massive... Uh, Massive boon here for Junior. Uh, 110 yeah. words per minute. Holy cow. Uh, give Junior me some of your lobby, skills, so we, we may get yeah. to see Junior play. Uh, maybe. Sit, sit in a bit. Maybe. Maybe. Right now, it's going to be the Junior symbol uh, who will be the, the Junior represented here. I'm just trying to make this as confusing as possible. Same. Junior. Symbol likes to play tennis, which is nice. Yes. I never really played much tennis, but it's hard. I know tennis is really hard. I, okay, so I played all the non-traditional sports. I mean, I'm 6'6", right? We were talking about this during the break. I'm 6'6", and my high school uh, coaches, all like the football team, the baseball team, the wrestling team, they're like, oh, you're so bad. You're bad. I played tennis, volleyball, and soccer. Those are my three sports. Okay. And I absolutely ticked off my coaches and all the other meatheads there at my high school in Colorado Springs uh, because I played the non-traditional sports and I really don't care what they thought about them. But looking at West Cliff Warriors here, uh, Sharks's, uh, Chieferton, and Sullins. Uh, we've got a graduate student, a senior, so definitely some senior influence here for West Cliff Warriors. I wish I knew what their actual record was other than the one by that they've had here and they've got Solens here uh, on the fresh uh, as a freshman going in on the IT Masters uh, Solens scene here. or Sulens? Sulens, Solens, uh, we'll go with yes. Uh, I, I'm going to go, uh, well, you know, you probably are right. Solens or Sulens is probably right, but that's okay. It looks like Sulens. I don't know. I'll forget if we're getting it wrong. We're doing the best we have with the information provided. Yes. At least, at least there's we know there's two syllables in this one. We do have a bit of a pronunciation guideline here, but sometimes it's tough. Yeah, it's tough to understand intention through those pronunciation guides sometimes. But we do know is both these teams are looking for their first win. Well, as far as we know, uh, we're just going to assume West Cliff Warriors are 0 0 since we have no information to tell us otherwise. So as far as I'm concerned, Billy, they have yet to win a game. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just making sure that there's nothing been uh, reported here, and it looks like UCB Blue has had this problem uh, throughout all three weeks that we've played this season right now. We are in week four, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we, you know what? I tell you what, we are going to get into this game uh, too sweet uh, as we get some car soccer going on here. Week number four, last stream of the night. It's a West Coast affair here between the West Cliff Warriors and the Fresno State Red Bulldogs. And I tell you what, I think this is going to be one of those uh, series where we just don't know what's going to happen. And we're along the ride with you. And we're going to have a damn good time calling the action going in. And we're going to get started right out the gate. And it looks like Westcliff is going to be out on the early possession. Oh, it's already been decided. It's 3-1. Series has already been decided. Okay. Never mind the playing. It's just the bars up top. That's all that matters. No, I, I, I tease. I tease. Kick takes off here. 
Westcliff hoping that's not a, a prediction of how the final score will go. I'm kind of hoping for a map five, honestly. Uh, I love map fives. I got one in my first series on B stream uh, with my friend on Odd Fellow. Uh, we had a fantastic series there. Uh, previously, uh, unwinnable team uh, getting their win on the season. I mean, great driving there from Solis. Or I'm going to go with Sulens uh, off of your phonetic spelling off of it. But uh, you know what? The defense there at midfield really started to light up. It's all going to be about who gets this midfield control early in this game. And right now, uh, Fresno State trying to get out. And how about it for a moment? West Coast, with a good touch, able to keep it in. There's another one. Symbol going through the air, finally able to at least push it down. Try to develop something on the offense, but West Coast are very easy, are very quick to recover. They're just going to send it right on back. The battle for possession of midfield is still up in the air here, Billy. I mean, we're seeing some double commits here in the defensive third coming from Westcliff. So uh, if we look at Fresno State right now, um, they might be able to get something off the back of that, but they have to be very aware of the counterattack coming through when they're pushing three members forward and having that third midfield line. Uh, there is space in the back for them to be susceptible to that counterattack. Very sure. Into the corner. Marcus. All the way back down to the other side. It's got a player in the middle Ooh. trying to work the upper 90, but that'll get blocked. Adrian looking to take it out of there. Will do so. Looking for their own oh, shot oh, off the oh. post. Follow-up is denied. Two opportunities from both of our teams. Nobody can get one to go just yet. We cross the three-minute mark and clear for Westcliff. Blocked at the line. He's going to send back over towards midfield. Takes a big bounce up top. Sue one's going to the sky to grab it. Ball lands in Adrian's hands. It's bounced back down and he's still battling it out here. No one seems to be able to, to really put much together. We've seen a, one or two good shots from each side, but past that, nothing really developing. Rebirth working out of the corner, but Fresno State, as good as they're good at holding in the zone, have not been able to really get it on net yet. That one's going to get denied as well. I mean, really, for Westcliff here, it's been about the aerials and their defensive third uh, being able to stop. Goals going in, and there we go, Zulins! Off the counterattack there, there was three in the offense for Fresno State, and we see them get back there and I mean you're looking at us uh, there uh, kind of lagging behind the play there and they get behind the defense and score the first goal of the game right after halftime here 215 on the clock Westcliff ahead 1-0 I don't think anybody expected to just go for that they were all looking for the center looking for the cross and oh. it just never came through shot oh. off the backboard rebound is just way up in the corner Adrian not happy with themselves after that one Simple gets a good challenge here to Give Fresno State another run. Adrian trying to chase this ball down. All going the wrong direction here for Fresno State as Sulens is able to scoop it up. Or towards the middle, <laughs> try to get it in there. Chief will put it home. What a uh, stuff. I mean, that's basically a goalie stuff right there in front. Look at Chief. There's the contact. There's the touch. And right over Ooh. Rebirth right there. Oh, Heck of a dunk. Yeah, that's just great. That's just beautiful out of them. 146 left on the clock here in game number one. And Westcliff out to a commanding 2-0 lead. Now, Fresno State have had their opportunities, but the uh, final touch has eluded them so far, Jeff. So I'm more, uh, maybe a little bit more, more physicality, a little bit more precision on the passes. And going into these 50s, I want to see them get a little bit more mustard on the back of it. There's some good passing there, but yeah, I was a little easily read by the defense. Adrian hoping they can speed things up a little bit. Two goals necessary here and about a buck 20 to work with. Oh. Shot gets blocked on that one. Adrian wants to keep it in. He's just going to develop a little soft tap to the other side. Rebirth can't get centered, and it's going back the other way. Opportunity here for goal number three. Denied by Adrian. Forced into the corner. Darkest just spinning off the backboard. Nobody but blue cars left. He's looking like an empty net. Sulans comes in to sure that one up. Make sure no freebies come through for Fresno State as we've crossed the one-minute mark. Fresno State really struggling to get this first goal right now. And they've lost possession. Westcliff are coming back. Counting on the blue cars right now. And uh, we need to see them getting a little bit more out of there. The Wallflowers reference from 1997. Uh, looking for them to push forward and maybe get a uh, one headlight working here to get them in the back of the net. And I mean, there's some good grinding pressure there in the front of the net. Ball pops up huge there, but nobody on the back of it. Dangerous move for Chief. 
Gonna dodge the bullet if that one didn't get just absolutely stuffed. Ball just dangling in front of the net. Good defensive move from Fresno State, but might be too little too late here as we've got 13 seconds remaining in game one. Ball put around the corner. Westcliff want one to take into game two. Another one, should I say. Final seconds here means Westcliff will come out on top. Fresno State get absolutely stymied here in this opening game. 2-0. Start things for the Westcliff Warriors. Aerial attacks uh, have been stymied out. Westcliff really good in the air. Uh, we've seen this, and here's another advantage of that right there. Uh, Sulins uh, getting the air dribble there across the midfield line, dunking it in. And then here we see, once again, Sulins off the air, uh, controlling the chassis very nicely. And then it's a centering pass there to Chief. So, I mean, that has been fantastic coming from them. So the air time right now for Westcliff. Uh, they're winning the aerial battle right now. I think that Fresno State need to get more physical on the ball. Uh, the midfield battle, eh, it's been kind of going back and forth, Jeff. So I think that, you know, if we if we want to look, uh, you know, at, at, at the X's and O's right now, I think physicality uh, for Fresno State right now has to be at the forefront of their game. Don't allow these long carries from the defensive third across the midfield line and either looking for a shot uh, or looking for some kind of dish off to their teammate. That's really what I'm looking at from Westcliff. They've really, you know, solidified on that. Two goals to their, to their fashion in that. I think the other thing for Fresno State right now is if they want to up the tempo, I, I think that they need to get themselves a little bit more invested into these 50 challenges. They're kind of letting these aerials go uh, and not getting them to a position where they can really challenge. And here we go once again. Shark is looking for the aerial touch, and we see them go into the air once again. Everyone's working out of the back. Yeah. Oh. Bearing it through the air. He uses a lot of resources oh. to do, but nobody able to get in front of him. Everyone ends up just... Escorting this one in for goal number one. I mean, this is just a walk through the park. A tiptoe through the tulips. I mean, it was a beautiful air dribble, Jeff. That, I mean, I just said, <laughs> this is what they're doing so well. Uh, and Fresno State has not capitalized or, or capitulated upon that point. So we're going to see. What can uh, Fresno State do to deny the aerial attack coming from Westcliff? Because they're down one in our series. And, I mean, if they don't figure this out real quick, they're going to be down looking and facing match point oh reaver finds a huge opening in the backfield caught the defense sleeping on this one maybe if they can't counter the air they can at least come through with their own ground attack and try to equalize exactly what rebirth's going to do tie this one up only 38 seconds into game number two i love it i love it and i mean that was a great interception just a quick little burglary uh there at the midfield line and carries it in nice little flick over the top of the defense and gets into the goal so I mean, maybe right now uh, they can use their speed advantage, uh, maybe start to monopolize some of these resources. I think that's what Fresno State really need to capitalize on right now, because if you take away the resources, Jeff, I think that's where you can stop this air attack in its tracks. A dangerous ball there for a moment. Adrian's able to go up and slow down Sewell, and so they can't take advantage of that. Midfield fight won by Westcliff for now. Adrian trying to work it out of the corner. Westcliff looking for an opening. Trying to go over the middle. Symbol's able to shut that down. But can move from Symbol there going through the air. Step number one has been kind of bet. See if they can keep it up. Another good touch from Symbol to push this one in the corner. Not a lot of aggression behind it as Fresno State wants to just rotate. They're getting deep rotations here offensively. It seems spread out across midfield. Symbol once again pushes it in. Here comes the backup with it this time. That shot off the post. Follow-up from Adrian gets absolutely denied. Double commit from the defense to make that save. Just off the backboard. Fresno State are staying aggressive. Nice tap there. Opportunity for Adrian. Ooh. That one will go home. 2-1 lead to Fresno State. You know, they're kind of being out resourced right now, but what they are really maximizing right now, Jeff, is that the fact that they've got the rotations down on lock. I think they've cleaned up from game number one, and this is their first lead of the day. So Fresno State, a uh, minute and 49 seconds in. They have a one goal lead, and now we need to see them be able to challenge in the sky. There's a shot of goal, and Chief gets it in there. Too much mustard on that shot. Once again, it's through the air. Chief off the ceiling with this one, and have really kind of found the Achilles heel of Fresno State. This time it's Westcliff who have to equalize, but they do it, and it doesn't take them long. Within seconds, it's gone from a 1-1 game to a 2-2 game. I like it. 
I like it. I mean, this is a kickoff play here from Fresno State. I, mean, I think this is going to turn into a ping pong match. I think we're going to see another seesaw battle here, Jeff, as we're seeing these two teams trying to really dominate the midfield. Uh, and these aerial challenges definitely going in the favor of Westcliff, but the ground battles, when you see the ball get closer to the turf, that's where Fresno State is really excelling right now. So uh, land versus air, uh, is it going to be the Army or is it going to be the Air Force winning here in game number two? Adrian driving down off the wall, open for some backup to come in, but it's a little too deep. And Fresno State wants to stay conservative here and protect this tie. Oh. Shot deep there, trying to get behind the defense. Not oh. quite work. Adrian doesn't make it to that ball. This is way deep in Fresno State territory. Racing back, there's one good touch, but Sharkus is there. Throw one on the post. Here comes a shot in. No flick there. Two players from Fresno State staying with that and from a defensive perspective. Ball is still in as Westcliff have two on the back. Ball, <laughs> one out deep. That shot's going to be off the mark. And now here comes Fresno State back the other way, working off the wall. Ball's going to drop in front of the net. No, it's pushed all the way across. Yep, I mean, that's a great attack coming from them. They absorbed uh, the two shots that came in from Westcliff and really turned that into a goal-scoring opportunity. Just not enough resources in the bank there for them to get on top of the ball. But, I mean, this is a fantastic answer to what Westcliff are providing aerially. Fresno State, I think they may have unlocked what Westcliff are trying to bring here in game number two. 90 seconds remain. Let's see if your theory is correct. Good touch from Rebirth. Into the corner. Goes up. Not fast enough. Symbol has to come in. Pushes that one back. Defense holds for now. Fresno State with nowhere to work. We're in about 20 seconds. Oh, uh, can they block this transition? No, they cannot. Subwoons is going to get one in off the crossbar. That was a perfect cross-section of how this entire series has gone so far, Jeff. We saw the ground challenges being won by Fresno State, but the aerial touch, once that ball was popped up into the air, we saw Westcliff be able to turn the play around and get themselves into an offensive position, and now they're up by one with a minute left on the clock here, Jeff. Uh, we're going to have to see this ground game here being able to take Westcliff out of the game, and demolitions might be the way to start to do that. Yeah, they're certainly trying that approach a little bit. Still Fresno State and find themselves in their own zone in front of their own net, as a matter of fact. Oof. And Demo out of Sulin is going to put even more pressure down on a Fresno State. Momentary slowdown favoring oh, there it is. Adrian with a long distance shots on point. Fresno State strike for midfield to tie this up with 37 seconds to go. Pressure on the ground for midfield. And you see it. I mean, they were ready for it. So, I mean, it, it's literally... Ground war versus air war. And who's going to come out on top? 37 seconds left here in game number two. Who knows how this is going to go around? That's a great rotation. Oh, my gosh. They had an open net. But Sulins, once again, on the spot. That yeah, good call out from Westcliff. Knowing that there was a moment there where everybody on that team was holding their breath. That could have been very dangerous indeed. Uh -oh. Here is another uh -oh, uh -oh. opportunity for Fresno State. Adrian finds the back door wide open. And Fresno State have now scored two unanswered to retake the lead here in the final seconds of Game 3. Game 2. You know, something I mean, something that uh, Oddfellow told me uh, in our last series and a much more experienced Rocket League caster than I am, sometimes when the ball goes in the corner, you don't have to touch it. Sometimes you just need to let it lie rather than giving a touch to the offense. And uh, that is a perfect example of what just happened there. And talk about Providential. Look at the long touch there. Rebirth is going to come back on the other side. It's going to be able to 50 there in the side as we close in on the last seconds here of game number two. Looks like it's going to be a 4-3 win here for Fresno State. The Bulldogs come charging back in game number two. Well, we're back at a complicated first to two now. Adrian with the hat trick in that one. I feel like Fresno State really poured on the shots. The first one, I didn't feel like we got much shots from either side, but Fresno State had a lot more offense going on there in game two. And, you know, despite the fact that they never really found an answer through the air, they didn't suddenly just get better with their aerials and are able to match Westcliff in that regard. So they just outshot it. They just kept pressure on. Able to strangle out the defense enough. Came through when it really mattered there in that final minute. Well, I, I think, Jeff, that the real answer here is the fact that the, they're committing to their 50s on the ground when there is an opportunity, uh, that goal being a 
exclamation point on that uh, that amount of aggression, that philosophy that they're trying to adopt right now is the ground war. Whenever the ball is down near the turf on the pitch, they're really going into these challenges with a full head of steam. They're not, uh, you know, kind of waiting off. You, you saw it in game number one where you'd see the members of Fresno State kind of veer off at the last second. Uh, here, they're going full board. There we go. Two perfect examples right there of what they're committing to. So they're going to commit to this ground war uh, and the war of attrition on the ground while they absorb the pressure coming in from the aerial. And that's a great save off of a quick shot out of West Coast. going in for another attempt here. Can he get Woo! over the last one? He can, but Sharkus comes in. Framework makes the dream work. Westcliff find the first goal of game number three. Out of the air once again, Solens with a nice dribble, nice little finesse touch to get it off the backboard and sets up Sharkus perfectly. Now, Fresno State. 19 seconds in not an insurmountable lead obviously it's one nil here in game number three and i mean you if you're fresno state right now you're looking for contact on the ground you're looking for contact you know maybe a meter or two off the ground but that's a great shot from Ooh. rebirth off of the 50 in the sky yep so it's doing their typical air thing drops it down rebirth just wait for it read that one from a mile away kept it just out of the defense's reach fresno Beautiful. state once again, these teams just don't take long to answer at all. It seems when one scores, the other immediately finds a way to retaliate. Fresno State keep that trend alive. And what is a tied series here? Game number three. A little bit of a collision there coming out of Westcliff as they move into the, the blue half. Oh, no. Nice little fake. Gets around one. Chief is going to push it out of the corner, but the third man isn't near enough. This is a good oh. bounce. Better save. Yeah, that's a great move there, uh, aerial style from Fresno State, which we are not expecting, and a demo to boot. So Symbol really putting their mark on this game. I mean, there's a touch there on the end. Good Lord, that's a great comeback from Fresno State as they almost uh, give up the go-ahead goal there. 3.15 off the clock here in game at number three. We're all tied up. We're tied up in the series 1-1, and the aerial attack has not dissipated here from Westcliff. The ground attack, though. Fresno State uh, starting to go to the air a little bit more and starting to win some of these battles, Chef. Yeah, lost a dangerous one there, but Adrian's able to cover. Now oh just looking Lord. to beat one. Has him beat. Adrian comes through once again for this squad. Got a hat trick of game two to propel Fresno State to a win here with an all-important tying goal. Or That's go -ahead beautiful. goal, rather. That's a go-ahead goal uh, in, a, in a minute and uh, uh, a minute 37 off the clock here. Game number three. Uh, symbol, I, I think it's really the catalyst right now. Uh, it has been going into these very uh, aggressively uh, and also making sure that the team is uh, behind them when they go into them. So, I mean, you can see the, tra the the communication going on the field. Adrian up in the sky once again wins that 50. Adrian has been so good on both sides of the pitch. Fantastic defense out of him in the first 45 seconds. Coming through with uh, the game leading goal right now. Or where to stand as was, as is, as will ever be. Double coming in, working in off the outside. And it's the battle of the corners. The ball was spit straight up. That's going to favor West. Cliff, they're trying to convert that here. It's going to be a good shot. It's going to go to the right-hand side. Not in between the box. It's outside the post. West Cliff's final shot just does not have anything on it. It seems like a good opportunity squandered here. Westcliff want to make the most of it. They know they've got to get one in. This feels like a very important attack, and Fresno State have shut it down. Well, they got 215 to get this goal in. So, I mean, it's only a one-goal lead right now. It's a very tenuous position right now for Fresno State. I mean, they're really responding uh, to this aerial threat right now. Adrian Reitman getting up in the sky and denying the work coming in. I mean, there's another save coming off the back of a demolition, and Adrian's going to carry it forward. Gets a nice little flick into the quarter, looking for a teammate. Yeah, gonna get stuck down there for a moment. Rebirth's turn to see if they can work out of the corner. Oh, Near no. post, ball in front of the net. Shot goes way wide. Fresno State had a chance to really solidify this thing. Symbol now pushes it back in. Buck 37 remain. Chief able to get over one at midfield. Got some speed, working into the corner. Is there any help in the middle? Way up in the air goes the ball, goes Westcliff. Dropping down, it's outside the net. Symbol's pushing out with it. 
As Adrian to the left-hand side will not beat Chief over the middle. The ball is going to bounce back into the two Westcliff territory. Into the corner it goes. Westcliff able to grab those boosts. Want to see if they can use all this resource pushing forward. Chief not able to get to it. Fresno State doing a good job of keeping the ball out of Westcliff's hands at the moment. There's a one-two pass. That shot's off. Yeah, I mean, just off there on the one-two combination, but I like it going against the run of play, and I think that would have been a worthy shot uh, had it been on target. However, uh, sub-60 seconds right now, Fresno State with the one-goal lead, 45 seconds left on the clock, and now we're starting to get a little bit more aerial possession coming out from Fresno State, and a big demo coming in. Ooh, Westcliff got a good piece of that ball. Adrian wanted to center that, and a pinch sends it all the way back into Fresno State territory. Let's go drive it forward. Less than 30 to go. Goal in front of the net. Shot in front of the net, rather. Not a goal. Thank you, uh, Fresno State defense. Get in front of that laser and deflecting it away. Another opportunity here for Westcliff. Rebirth working off near post. It's going to be a touch. Up high. Denied. Symbol screams across for the save. I mean, this is exactly what they want right now. And I mean, that was beautiful position. I think all sides are concerned. And now we're in the zero second drill. You got to pop the ball up. Got to keep it up there, Chief. Looking for somebody in the middle and does not find it. That it's going to be grounded. That'll be match point now for Fresno State. So they absolutely come out the gate here uh, looking a lot more refreshed. I mean, out of Sulens. I mean, that was a fantastic setup goal. Their aerial attack has been thwarted here, though, Jeff. And I, I think right now uh, for Fresno State as they take now. Uh, the two goal or two game lead. They go into match point here and Westcliff, they're looking a little bit on the back foot. The aerial attack is not working as well. Adrian going to the skies quite a few times now has been the answer that they need. Yeah, Fresno State really answered back. Strafter drop a game one. They've come back in two and three with a vengeance. Both of them are one goal games. I mean, they were really close, Billy. But Fresno State able to stay on top and, I mean, even come from behind uh, to, to put this one away. And that one, they didn't have to come behind too much. But, uh, you know, it was, still, it was still a comeback nevertheless. I mean, you always like to see it. And as we head into game number four now, uh, Westcliff facing match point here against Fresno State. And uh, Westcliff, you know what? I, I think that they need to get more physical on the ball. I think they also need to speed up the tempo. And we're starting to see demos come out right from the get-go. So the physicality definitely coming out here in game number four. Fresno State looking to fulfill our prophecy from the very beginning of the series and make this a 3-1 <laughs> victory. Westcliff trying to deny the hands of fate. We're against destiny. Create their own destiny and create a map five. I mean, Fresno State right now is looking to make a Storm Warrior and Pulse. Polaroid, our production people look like uh, prophetic people. And Adrian, with the carry and the kiss off the chassis, gets the first goal. Goal number five for Adrian through the series, leading the server right now. Incredible pressure out from Fresno State. Do not look like they are slowing down in the slightest. Well, for Westcliff right now, uh, it's about physicality. I think that you need to deny any kind of solid touches coming out from Fresno State. Also, the resource management, uh, they're getting beat out to these midfield boosts right now uh, by by about a stream of two to one. So, I mean, looking at where we're going from here, uh, you know, it's all going to be about, you know, do we have the adaptability? Of Can they take this ground game that Fresno State has really worked to perfection here uh, games two and three? and really take it to the Bulldogs because Westcliff are sitting on match point. Well, and that's part of playing the aerial game as much as Westcliff does. That was, could have been a dangerous miss there at midfield. I was gonna say eventually coming to challenge. Adrian might have an opportunity here. It's the follow up from the backfield. That'll get it done. Rebirth, it takes a couple of touches, but in the end, the ball ends up in the goal. And it's the far more resource conservative approach along the ground from Fresno State that is winning out thus far here in game number four. Yep, reactive versus proactive. And sometimes, you know, I always like to see a proactive team going out there and make, taking the game on their terms. Fresno State kind of taking a page from the past and being reactive. So these aerial plays that are coming in from Westcliff, they're just waiting back and seeing where the ball is going to drop or where the, uh, where the trajectory of the car coming in is going to be really landing in their center. And then they react to it at that point. So I think right now, 
Uh, oh, that's a great answer, though, from Sharkus. What a pass. They played a little bit too passive defensively there. They were kind of riding their laurels for a second, and Sharkus gets them in the end. Oh, real quick decision there from Chief. I uh, knew the communication was there, knew they had Sharkus coming in in tandem, and the two prong attack working beautifully. The pass off the wall, Johnny on the spot, couldn't have been more accurate. What a way for Westcliff to get themselves cut this lead in half right back into this game four situation. Oh no. And the hopes of defying destiny. Sulin's coming in hard, drops it off, deposit in through the <laughs> net, but there's nobody there to finish it off. Blair from Fresno State might turn oh, no. into a goal as there is a nasty miss from Westcliff that could be costly. I don't know if that was a miss or if it was a bump there at the midfield line. We'll see. Yeah, there was a little bit of contact there, Jeff. So uh, I think that the physicality uh, that we've seen all series long from F Fresno State really lending itself there to a goal for rebirth. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, the touch there at the midfield line. A little bit of a, physical, a physical touch that just, just took enough. them off their trajectory. Yep, just yeah. enough. Shot here is going to go wide and takes an unfortunate bounce for Westcliff. They were hoping it would bounce towards the middle, but it's back out across the green. Fresno State racing over midfield. Trying to see if they can get behind this defense. Work out this corner quickly. It gets slowed down, but Rebrose is going to put a nice center into the middle. Adrian shot is a little lackluster. Falls into the hands of Sulens. Comes over the middle with a couple teammates at their side. Gets interrupted by a symbol, and Fresno State are able to clear. Yep, fantastic work out from uh, Fresno State defensively there. And uh, Westcliff right now, uh, they've got answers that need a... Uh, that need to be uh, dealt with right now. Uh, I think right now they need to change the tempo up. They need to be getting more physical once again. Uh, as we're under two minutes now, they're in a two-goal deficit. Plenty of time for them to get back in the series, and that's a good start. There we go. Looking at the shot, there we go. Traffic in front of the net, Jeff. That's what they got. You know, look at Sharkus right here. A little touch there, a little kiss off the top, a little bit of a diddle commit, and then back in the net against the run of play. Beautifully scored goal there from Chief. Westcliff was all over the place. Fresno State didn't know where they were going. High, low, left, right. There was no way to predict that ball. The pinch off the ground just starts it off with this odd bounce. Uh, and then the very smart decision to go up with the ball. Draws two defenders. Well done by Westcliff right in front of the net. They, they are able to completely scramble the defense of Fresno State. And now they're threatening once again. Ooh. Good challenge. is going to put the ball off the backboard. It is read by Fresno State, and they're going to get it out of there. But Sharkus is still cherry-picking down here. Chief comes through with a touch. Goes right to Symbol. That's a bit clear. This could be on target. Adrian for transition goal. Back to Symbol. This one is blocked. Westcliff able to hang on momentarily. Oh, my goodness. And the double tap there attempt uh, was blocked out by Westcliff. So, I mean, great rotations defensively. This game is not over by any means. I, I think we're looking at the rebirth here of Westcliff. They are feeling it right now. They're looking at a shot of goal. What a great pre-jump there from Fresno State. They deny the shot opportunity, and now it's going the other way. Adrian with a chance to put this one away. It will not miss that. Comes off of the incredible defensive read. With a symbol who made that block that you were talking about. Adrian dances around the defense. And that could have been it. That could be the nail in the coffin. The proverbial dagger. The sharp, stabby thing. That's going to send the <laughs> West Cliff home. I mean, uh, uh, what, what do we call it? The, uh, the spar of death. Uh, definitely going in the way of Fresno so far here in game number four. Uh, they have been pushed. Uh, Westcliff is a very worthy opponent for this Bulldog side, but right now, Westcliff, 30 seconds left. Two goal deficit. They need to score now in the next 10 seconds to have any chance of getting back in this series. Opportunity. Sulens up. There Beat he is. the defense. Sulens is able to keep Westcliff's hope alive. Yep, and I mean, look at the touch. It's the touch from midfield on the ground. Uh, which is not what we were expecting, by the way. Uh, they've got a lot of work done out of the air, but Solens in the air off of that ground touch buries it in the back of the net. 18 seconds to get an equalizer. Symbol with the steal. 14 seconds, ball in the orange half. 
Rebirth just driving forward, trying to put this away. Adrian's going to steal the ball off the wall, put it towards the orange net. Adrian has been spectacular all day long for Fresno State, and that touch might have been just enough yep. to give them the edge. Fresno State will come back after losing game one and find their first win of the season, as far as we're concerned. A lot of I mean, it on the back was... of Adrian here. Six goals for Adrian on the day, Billy. I think that symbol is actually the the MVP though. I think the symbol was all over the pitch, uh, both defensively and offensively, getting assists, uh, getting the uh, uh, crucial touches, and we saw a couple of fantastic saves out of symbol as well. That point blank shot, uh, I think, was the real exclamation point on game number four, where we saw him just dive in front of the goal uh, and and save the equalizing goal uh, with about two minutes left to go in game number four. I think that was a real turning point because I think Westcliff thought that they had the goal there and were not able to capitalize on the back of it. And here, I mean, we see the aerial attack. I mean, the aerial attack coming from Westcliff all day long was fantastic, but Fresno State, in the end, staying to the ground, going to the air only when they had to, really wins out the day, Jeff. This was a fantastic series. Uh, I wouldn't have my head hung down at all for either of these teams. I mean, that was such a spectacular save, and that really, <laughs> that save from Symbol. Got a frog in my throat. It choked me up, Billy. That's Woo! how good that save was. It choked I know. me up. I'm all verklempt. Uh, but it did really feel like the turning point. Uh, it, it felt yeah. like the, the momentum just was completely sucked out of the, the sails of Westcliff at that point. Uh, yeah. And despite, you know, kind of being kind of being the assist guy, kind of being the setup player, uh, I got really Symbol had a, had a spectacular day, so... Hey, there you go. Congrats to Fresno State. Well done. First recorded win. Oh, report your scores, people. Come on now. Right. I mean, and this is, a, you know, hopefully the start of a very good season for them. So, Westcliff, got to go back to the drawing board. But Fresno State, your winner's here on the end of the day. And you know what? That's the end of tonight's it action is. here on the NECC. Yep. Big shout out to Polar Studios and behind the scenes here this evening. Uh, but most importantly, thank y'all. Thank y'all out there very much for, for hanging out with us. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, and it's been an absolute privilege uh, to get to bring you these final games of the week. Uh, we'll see you next week for week number five. Uh, until then, be kind, be generous, be good to each other. Have a good night, y'all.